see a lot of familiar faces. We, uh, back in 2019, we did a whole series of things here that was a lot of fun. Um, so it's really, it's great to see people back here. This is the first time I've actually had a group of people in here for this type of thing in, uh, well, oh, well over two years at this point. So, so it's great. It's great to see you. So thanks for coming. Um, what I thought I'd do today is a series of different techniques, exploring some ways you can veneer some curved parts. I do quite a lot of veneer work in, in my work, um, which you can see at my website if anybody's interested. And a lot of you guys have probably seen it. But um, So I thought we would do three things. One is we would do a um, veneered like OG molding with a waterfall edge, and that is going to be a combination of some vacuum bag techniques and then some either hammer veneered or just like clamped with a call techniques to get the waterfall. So we'll, we'll go through that. Um, I thought I would show you guys, this is a pretty quick one, but it's kind of an interesting one. If you guys, people that are getting into vacuum bagging, most of the time when you're doing veneer work in a vacuum bag, you're using a call underneath the work to help move the air away from the, the piece. Um, and that's a pretty, if you've made some kind of a bent laminated piece, like for a door or something that's going to be veneered, you can use the mold that you um, that you use to make the, the panel to veneer the top. It gets a little bit more complicated, I find, with the inside because sometimes you don't actually get accurate pressure against that call once you've got a, um, or against that mold, rather. So I'm going to show you guys a technique to veneer the, an inside curve without a platen, basically just using the bag itself. So we're, we'll do that. And, and the other technique I wanted to introduce you guys to, um, and it sounds like you guys are doing some, some hammer veneering with high glue, traditional hammer veneering with high glue. Um, I was going to show a technique using uh, hammer veneering with a PVA glue and a hot iron, uh, which is a pretty great technique, frankly, for flat work, um, but it's really useful for doing um, curved stuff, and in particular you can use it to do a little bit of compound curve veneering. So we're going to try to veneer around this bullnose edge here. Um, and I, I made this yesterday, it's a 12 inch radius, so a 24 inch top, and I was looking at it, I was like, I actually don't know if I've ever done this around such a tight radius, so this will be kind of exciting to see if we can actually pull it off or not, but um, I think we can. Uh, we're going to use um, uh, a walnut burl for that, which is usually the one of the things you can manipulate the most. There's a reason why Rolls-Royce interiors are made out of uh, walnut burl. It's because it's, it tends to be the stretchiest. So. No wavy? Um, oh man, yeah, can you imagine? Yeah. I don't think you have much luck. Um, so we're going to be bouncing around a little bit because you know some things are going to have to kind of sit dry and then sit. So I'm going to be bouncing between these three things. I'm going to do a lot of stuff up here, but I, I have the vacuum bag set back up back there. In retrospect, I maybe could have set up slightly differently. So I think what we're going to do is every once in a while I'm going to jump over there. You guys can just spin around maybe. And I don't think anything that happens over there is going to be relatively short, so you don't have to necessarily move chairs. We can just kind of maybe crowd around to whatever degree you're comfortable, and, and I'll do a spiel there, and then we'll, we'll hop back over here. So there's going to be a little bouncing around. We can take a break at some point. but um, So when you're working with curved veneers, or you're veneering curved surfaces, I generally find you increase your success rate significantly if you treat the veneer in some manner. Um, I, I suspect most of you guys that have done any um, veneering with you know commercial thickness veneers as opposed to shop sound veneers have probably seen the commercially available veneer softeners. They all tend to, most of them are glycerin based. There's one called Super Soft that I think is sold by um, Veneer supply, maybe. Yeah, Joe Woodworker. Joe Woodworker, yeah, which has some other series of chemicals in it that I've been trying to figure out what they are. I've been trying. If anybody knows an organic chemist that wants to talk like wood glue and veneer softeners for like several hours, let me know because I've been trying to. I just started teaching a intro to woodworking course at UNH this semester, and like 
no kidding, one of the reasons I took the job, because it doesn't care very well, um, is that uh, I'm like, maybe I can meet somebody in the organic chemistry department and like pick their brain on this. So, because I would love to go a little bit deeper on these things, but um, anyway, that's an aside. Um, the solution, those glycerin-based solutions, they work pretty well. They, they're really good for flattening like burls and crotch veneers and stuff for flat stuff. They don't do a great job once you start getting into curved things, particularly once you start getting into compound curves, um, where you're really asking the veneer to do quite a lot. So the solution that I typically use, I wrote it up here, it's based off of a, it's a combination of a solution that a, um, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name, ah, oh, the guy from Vacuum Pressing Systems. Uh, Daryl Keel, thank you. It's basically one, it's a version of what he uses. The difference is the addition of the acetone. Um, and this is a solution. The main thing though is there's a PVA glue in there. Um, you can use any kind of PVA glue. Honestly, you can use like a white Elmer's glue. I typically use Type Bond 1 because it's what I have in the shop mostly. Um, and that's, that's kind of the key ingredient. Like, you know, you could probably do it without the alcohol or the acetone. My, my theory on the acetone and the alcohol is that what it's doing is it's, it's giving it a little bit more bite, so it's penetrating a little harder, and then it's kicking off a little bit faster. Because the, the process that we, we're going to go through here is one of like really saturating this stuff and then trying to dry it again. Um, so it's a fairly long, well, it's a <coughs> relatively long process. So I think the key things really are the water, the PVA glue, and the glycerin. Um, and what you're really doing is you're kind of almost plasticizing the veneer and sizing it. Yep. What's the purpose of the acetone? My sense, and I could be wrong about this, again, this is why I need to talk to a chemist, is that um, it's helping it to penetrate a little bit more into the wood and then those chemicals are flashing off a little bit faster than the water is, but could okay. be. Well, could could be the acetone is going to combine with the water. You're going to, I mean, absorb the, some of the water. Possibly, yeah, I don't know. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, you know, I mean, in some applications, people use dish soap, you know, a couple drops of dish soap to reduce surface tension. To emulsify, is that, yeah. Do you ever try that? I haven't, no. Um, but it's possible that would work. Again, not a chemist, so. Um, basically what you're trying to do is, is, is both soften, somewhat plasticize, and, um, and, um, and size the surface of the, of the veneer. And what you, this is one, these are a couple pieces that I did yesterday. So this is from the same flitch, and you can see like that's not that flexible. And this stuff is like, it's almost like leather. You, know, you can really yeah. manipulate it pretty well, so. Do you brush it on or spray or? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a couple. I mean, we won't, it's not stuff we'd be able to use today because it's like, this is stuff I did yesterday and frankly, it's still actually a little bit wet. Um, this time of year, it takes a while sometimes for it to, to dry and um, I think it'll work for what we're doing today, but probably if I were doing this for a, a pr actual project, I wouldn't use this today. I might wait another day. Um, but there's kind of a window too because some of this stuff is stuff that I probably had flattened before and um, it does dry out again and it becomes brittle again. So there's kind of a window of, I find, after, well it depends what I'm trying to do. If I'm trying to do something really aggressive, um, really within a few days, if it's something fairly mellow than, you know, a week or so, and it seems to be okay, but... Um, Where do you source the glycerin? On? Um, glycerin you can get from a feed store. Um, I believe it's some kind of a horse laxative. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you can buy it in gallon containers. Tractor company? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, this one came from my local Clark's up in, I live up in Barnstead. There's a Clark's in Pittsfield. Um, yeah, Anamed. I mean, for a gallon, it was forty-five bucks. I think I've had this for probably eight or nine years at this point. But I was actually up in Maine teaching, and I needed some glycerin, um, and I couldn't find it at any of the local feed stores up there. And my wife said, "Go to the 
health food store because they'll have it there. And I was like, oh, what are you talking about? They're not going to have it at the health food store. So I went to about 50 other stores first, and then I went to the health food store. And um, of course, she was right. And you know, lesson learned. Just listen to my wife right out of the gate. Because um, apparently, they use it to make. You can make cosmetics with it, so they sell it in smaller containers at the health food store too. So. You can get that online, uh, and it's very inexpensive. Yeah. You have to get a gallon. Yeah, so it's pretty easy to find. It goes a long way. You don't need a lot of it, you know, no. one part glycerin. So like I said, I've been using this for years. Um, so real quick, I'll, I'll kind of go, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Because um, like I said, it's a little bit of a long process, but we'll at least kind of go through the steps so you guys can do it if you were so inclined. Um, when you make that mix up, how long does it last? Can you leave it in a jar forever? Um, no, there's, it starts to get a little weird after a few months. It starts to separate. So I, I tend to mix it in, a, in quantities that I'm going to use within a month or so. Um, I mean, you can actually see it's already starting to separate. I think I mixed this up uh, last month. I was teaching up in Maine, and I, I mixed them up. So um, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's some chemical things going on in there that... Um, start to wane at a certain point. So let's see what can we throw in here. So I'll do two pieces just to kind of show you the process. Um, so the process here is basically going to be soak it, like really saturate it, let it sit and cook for a while, and then we start flattening it and drawing the moisture back out of it. Um, so I set it up in some plastic wrap. And you can brush this stuff on, but frankly, I find it easier to just kind of smush it around with, with my hands. It's one less thing I'm throwing away. Shake that up. And I, like I said, I want this to be pretty, pretty wet, so I'm going to pour some of that on. Then I just kind of work that in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very. This is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is. I am not a. Um, I mean, even when you mix this up, like I'm not mixing it up. You know, I, those ratios are. I'm not like weighing them out or anything. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I don't think this is something where it matters that much if you've got a little bit more of one thing or a little bit less of another. Um, Good. The main thing is just making sure like the surface is, is pretty saturated. I'll try to reuse these gloves a little bit, otherwise I'm constantly throwing them away. I love. And then I'm just gonna wrap this up. And the main thing here is I just want this to be pretty tight. I mean this is there's a there is a ton of PVA glue in here, and obviously the risk is is that I could just glue the whole thing together and then I've just got one sort of useless mass. Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm going to let this sit, I usually let it sit for at least an hour, but I've gone as long as three hours without it sticking together, as long as it's sealed up pretty good. So I just wrap it up like that, and then I just set a timer for an hour. So we'll set a timer for an hour, and we'll do a couple other things. And after it's cooked for a bit. Do you need a super warm environment? If your shop is like 60, 65 degrees, is that going to be a problem? Well, that's a good question. I, I, would, I wouldn't think that it would matter. I mean, at the temperature where it's comfortable to be in the space, I don't imagine it would be problematic. It's not, I don't think there's a chemical reaction happening there that's specifically temperature dependent. I mean, okay. I suppose if it were really, really cold, everything might be a little stiffer and it wouldn't penetrate as hard, but I, I have not found that to be problematic. It's not like a you know, like a unibon glue or something where it has to happen at 70 degrees and buggered otherwise, but. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we'll let that cook and we'll start another thing here. Um, so I think the next thing we'll talk about because there's some dry time on that is um, this hammer veneering with a PVA glue. Um, so you guys are 
I imagine, familiar with um, hammer veneering with a high glue, so it looked like a hot high glue, and you paint that on, and then you use a veneer hammer, to, which does two things. I mean, it's, it's, you're using the pressure of the hammer to kind of smooth out the veneer and, and move the glue out, and also it's, you know, usually it's a metal hammer, which acts as a heat sink, and it's pulling that heat away from that hot glue so that it's drying again. I have one time in my life done a project with traditional hide glue and I found it to be disgusting and frankly I don't ever want to use it again. It smells terrible, it's messy. And when I first started making furniture I did a lot of um, Art Deco stuff and there was a lot of sort of hammer veneered elements to that so I, I started looking for other techniques to do that with and something that I came across um, is this idea of using sort of the inherent characteristics of PVA glue um, to use that uh, as, a, as the glue to, to hammer veneer. And, um, PVA glue, it's a thermoplastic glue, so it, it basically will, there is a window during which you can reactivate the glue with the use of heat, and it reliquifies and will adhere. Um, for type bond one, which is mostly what I use for this, that window is somewhere around 24 hours or so, after which it just doesn't really work anymore. Um, type on two, I think, is a slightly larger window. Um, there are some other differences between the two. You, you, any PVA glue will work. Um, I've not ever used type on three, um, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. Um, I mostly use Type Bond 1, and mostly because it's the glue I typically have in the shop. I don't use a lot of Type Bond 2, frankly, I don't like it very much. Um, but Type Bond 2 does have some advantages. Um, one of the main differences between using 1 and the 2 is the 1 will reliquify at a lower temperature than the 2, which is sometimes advantageous. Um, and I find it a little, it's a little less fussy because of that. Um, but sometimes that higher melting temperature is actually useful and you can use that to your advantage like if you're seaming things together with type on two and then put, applying them with type on one you can apply it at a lower temperature and those seams won't split because that glue has not reliquified um, I've been told also that type on extend is a very good one and is in fact the strongest once it's um, sat but I, I have no personal experience with that so I don't know if that's true or not but um, but I usually use Type Bond 1. Um, there's also a product called Heat Lock Glue that's sold, I believe Joe Woodworker, that, which has already come up, sells a product called Heat Lock that specifically designs for this. The thing with the Heat Lock, the, that's actually designed to liquefy at a really low temperature, like much lower than Type Bond 1. I almost find it to be, t like it'll actually, I find it will almost act like a, like a contact cement in the sense that once you put the two sides together, it will almost grab, even without using the iron, which I suppose might be useful in certain circumstances, but in general I like the ability to kind of be able to place the piece and then tack it. So, um, I have played around with the, the heat lock a few times, but I don't really like it very much. Um, but I, I could see that it would have applications. Um, so again, mostly what I use is the Type Bond 1. Um, and the process for this is to basically paint it on and then we're going to let it dry for some amount of time until it kind of skins over and it's more or less dry to the touch and then um, and at that point you can then iron it on. And we're going to glue both surfaces so we'll do a couple here. I'm going to do a flat one that we can kind of talk about first and then I'll do the, this guy and see if we can make that work. Um, so I'm about to put a bunch of water-based glue on this, and as I'm sure you guys all you know, know, once you put a water-based glue on a piece of veneer, it's gonna curl up. Um, there's a couple ways you can deal with that. Um, you can either spritz the opposite side, which kind of balances out the moisture you're gonna add. Frankly, I find it easier just to tape the piece down to, to something and because um, typically I'm slightly oversized anyway so if the edges don't get glue it doesn't really matter um, but if it were something where this really mattered that you get glue all the way up to the edges for some reason then you know you could the other technique does work 
I just find I either put too much water on it or not enough, so it still curls anyway. Um, and then we're going to paint this, and we're going to paint that. I'm probably going to wish that I had a larger brush. Um, I want I should roll this. Um, and I tend to put a little bit more than I would probably if I were like vacuum veneering this, which I don't know how necessary that is necessarily, but I kind of feel a little bit like something is being lost. And I, I want there to be a, a pretty decent glue line in there. I mean, typically if I'm vacuum veneering, I'm only putting, I'm not putting glue on the veneer. I'm just putting glue on the substrate. Do you uh, use the uh, 800 glue at all? The, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, increasingly less, I find, because it's... Um, oops, I should have made some room for that. Um, increasingly less because it's become so um, problematic. It's such a, so they changed, they took a lot of the formaldehyde out about, I don't know, eight years or so back um, to comply with... Um, new environmental standards, which, you know, that's great, and like, frankly, as somebody that uses it, I guess I'd just assume it's not full of formaldehyde. Um, but the upshot of that has been, it used to, so there's a chemical reaction that happens, do you, you guys know the Unibon, so Unibon 800, it's a two-part urea formaldehyde glue, it's a resin and a powder, once you mix them, it sets off a chemical reaction that basically cures the glue. But that chemical reaction needs to happen at a specific temperature. And that temperature used to be 60 some odd degrees. When they took all the formaldehyde out, um, well, not all the formaldehyde, a lot of the formaldehyde out, it bumped that temperature up to somewhere between 70 and 75 degrees. And I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think there are that many wood shops in, in New England that are 75 degrees in the winter. So. Well, Daryl recommends uh, using, uh, just to get a uh, heating blanket. Exactly, and I, I have two king-size electric blankets that, um, and I go so far as to, I will heat up the, I will, but prior to using it, I will put a blanket over my substrate and get that up to temperature. You'll see I have a hook in front of that Modine heater there, and I will actually hang the glue, the resin, in front of that and get that slightly up to temperature. I do everything I can to basically keep that in that temperature range. Because I've had two failures as a result of um, temperature. One on a, a big window arch um, that... I mean, the nice thing about it is there's no, like... You don't... you. There's no um, wondering whether or not it's cured. It's either has or it hasn't. And if it hasn't, I mean, I, I had a big window arch that was on a, on a mold and I pulled all the clamps off and it just went and all the laminations popped open. Um, and then the other time was on a dining table top, a walnut dining table top that I'd veneered. And um, um, it just delaminated immediately. And that, that one was more pain because I had to remill the surface basically to take it off because it, it had cured in a couple spots so I couldn't just like pop the veneer off. So that was a pain. So yeah, so now I just do everything with... But the only time I really use it at this point is, um, I mean, the, the major advantage to it besides it being a more rigid glue, which is quite nice for veneering, um, is that uh, it's... Um, the open time is like 40, well, depending on how you mix it, you can mix it different ratios, but the, I typically mix it at a 4 to 1 ratio, which um, gives me about 45 minutes or so, which is really nice, obviously, if you're doing a large project. Um, so I'm just making sure I got glue on all of my surfaces here. Um, particularly where I try to make sure I've got enough is is at this point. So, you know, I've veneered the bottom of this. The idea is, is if this is a tabletop and you want to come around that bull nose, you got to have a seam somewhere. You obviously can't do it in one shot. So, um, but if, I find if you have a seam down there, it's not super duper noticeable. Um, but I want to make sure that I've got pretty good glue surface. 
at that seam. And we can always add a little more later. That's one of the nice things about this technique. Uh, it's just, this is just MDF. It's just a three quarter inch MDF. So how do you keep it? Do you size it first before you? Um, I mean, I'll be honest. I probably wouldn't really do it out of MDF. Like oh. if I were doing an actual tabletop, okay. um, I tend to make my own substrates out of um, uh, plywoods, and then I might I might skin it with an eighth inch MDF. Um, I also would typically do two layers of veneer. Um, but I didn't want to get too in the weeds on those specifics for the purposes of the... Two at once? No, I'll do one and then do a... Yeah, yeah, exactly, like a cross banded kind of thing. I mean, to some extent it would depend on the design, but um, I'm just going to put this over here. Um, Alright, so that's going to take a little bit of time, so we'll let that sit for a bit. Have you ever used the uh, Better Bond Express? No. From uh, Vineyard Supplies? No. What is that? It, I just tried a gallon of it. It's, uh, it's very nice. It, it doesn't bleed through as much. Oh, okay. And it, is it a PVA glue or is it a two part glue? Or? Yeah, it's a PVA. Yeah. I can show you the word. I use, I mean, so, I mean, since we're on it and we'll be using this for some of these things, this is what I've used now. Same company, Unibond Vacuum Pressing Systems up in yeah. Maine. Great company. Um, this is their. They came out with this because so many people complained when they changed the formula in the urea formaldehyde. So it's a, it's a one part PVA glue, but it's a lot more rigid. And again, I don't know the chemistry of why specifically, but it's more rigid than a regular PVA glue. It has a slightly longer open time, not a ton. I mean, you've still only got 15, 20 minutes, but you know, sometimes two or three minutes is the difference between a success and a failure yeah. when it comes to veneering. Yeah. So, um, so I really like this. I, I tend to use it for really anything that I, I have, I can do in under 20 minutes, I'd use this for at this point. And if I get over that, then I start thinking about u using the Unibon 1, or Unibon 800 rather. So, But no, I'm not familiar with that. I, I, my guess is it's probably something pretty similar to this. Yeah, they said uh, they sort of optimized it. And, uh, have properties not bleeding through. Yeah, yeah, and this is a little bit thicker and um, and you can yeah, you can dye, you can tint this. I mean, with dyes if you want to change the color and you can put additives to it and I mean there's various things you can do if you are so inclined. But what are you using now on those? The type on one? It's just type on one. It's just this. Yeah. Like I said, this is for the same thing as the you know, one? Um, it's the same concept. It's a PVA. They're both polyvinyl acetate, water-based, one-part glues. There's some chemistry in that. that again, I don't totally understand. That makes it a, a more rigid, slightly more rigid glue, and a little bit longer of, of working time than this. This to me seems similar, and I'm, I'm, it's probably psychological because it's the same color, but it, it behaves somewhat similarly to the Unibon Three. The difference being when this dries, it's it's a it's a much it's clearly a much harder glue line than Type on Three. I always find Type on Three is a little rubbery, and this is not. Um, but out of the bottle, it's pretty similar. Um, any more questions on glue? Yeah. Um, all right, so let's let that dry for a bit, and then we'll come back to it. We got that cooking. Let's talk about this for a bit. Um, so this one, I did, so I'm, I just had a piece of um, Macassar ebony, a little scrap piece. Um, I thought we could use this to, um, you know, make, a, make up a piece and, um, and press it on there. Technically speaking, I think this is shallow enough. You could probably get away, frankly, with not. Um, pre-treating it, but I kind of figure it's it's not that big of a process, and I feel as if it gives me some more, um, it's just insurance, if, if that makes sense. So, so we're going to cut this into a few pieces, and, um, and tape it up, and then we're going to press this in the vacuum bag. Um, so I made this, I'm shooting for this to be somewhere around two inches. Um, this is a based off of a design, table design I did a number of years ago. Um, and I actually, I taught that table as a class at Mark Adams last year. So I've got these nice samples from that. 
Um, so I'm shooting for two inches, but I actually made my blank at about two and three eighths because when I veneer this piece on, I don't want it to be long. I don't want it to be longer than the piece I'm veneering it onto um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, well, the main reason is when I press this, I'm not really going to have much of a call over this. We're going to use something for call, but it's going to be a flexible call. And I don't want the veneer to run out because what can happen then is you know, if my veneer is running out over that edge and then the flexible call snaps that off, it can snap. See how when that snapped, that snapped behind that edge? So that's really problematic. But you could compensate for that by making your, uh, when you cut the holder, make it a little wider than yeah, that's, which is what this is. This is about, right now, this is about three eighths of an inch wider than my, my goal. So I kind of, what I did is I've actually laid out a layout line three sixteenths in on either side. So that's, that's what I'm shooting for, basically. So I know as long as my veneer is somewhere in between that line and the edge, I'm going to have plenty of material, basically. So that's kind of what I'm shooting for. There's another factor at play here, though, and that is I'm going to, you know, I want I want to get this waterfall edge to work. So, on a straight grain thing like this, this is slightly less problematic because you have a little bit more leeway here. But what what I kind of want to avoid is cutting out some huge chunk between this piece and this piece. Because the more I cut out, the more grain shift there's going to be, and the less that's going to line up. And that's going to be that's the the longer that is, the more that's going to be apparent. So if I've got a really long sideboard or something, I'm trying to nail a waterfall edge on. So there is kind of this like balance between really wanting to kind of nail this pretty close so that when I go to glue the waterfall edge on, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping that grain in line. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot to be just about on that line. I, and the other thing is, is like, if this ends up being 2 and a 16th or 1 and 15 sixteenths, like, you know, I don't think anybody's going to call me out on that. So like, I, I, I have some sort of built-in ability to be flexible here and, you know, when I, I'm teaching beginning students that like that's there's this concept of like what's on your drawing versus like the reality of what you're actually working with and being able to shift between those two things is is pretty important um, so I'm going to square up a, a corner of this here and I'm going to use a knife to do that So I kind of figured that if I want to be more or less between these two lines here, and that is two and an eighth approximately, and then I also want at least a quarter of an inch here, so that's two and three eighths, but I also want some extra, so um, at least to start off with so I can square things up. So I, I've got a block here that I cut at two and three quarters. Now I got a square edge. I can just butt that in right here and then set that block up and a sharper blade here. And uh, I can make that cut now. And what I'm going to try to do is take these off in order um, so that I can kind of match the grain as best as possible as I set this up. I'll do three pieces. That should be plenty for, for what we're doing. So that's it. this is just how it came off. And this doesn't have to be a perfect square line because like I said, I'm going to square everything up anyway. So there's three pieces. Um, so what I like to do when I'm lining up something with a pretty straight grain, um, so there's two ways of matching veneer, right? If I like, if I open something up, 
you know, I could basically take the flitch and open it up like a book, that's called a book match, or I could take that flitch and slide it out like that, and that's called a, a slip match. What I tend to do on these where I've got one piece where I'm matching the grain um, is I do, I, I call it a, a slip and a slip and flip, <laughs> where I basically take this piece and instead of doing this, which in this material probably would work, but in some things it doesn't work as well, is I actually do this. And what that does is that lines up that grain that's next to one another, um, if that makes sense. And so now this one would just go this way because that's um, that's the you know that's this side basically. So that so I'm I'm matching the the sides as they came off of the piece. Um, and I find, like I said, in this Macassar ebony, honestly, it probably doesn't matter. But in some things, there's a real difference between one side and the other in terms of the qual the color or how close the grain lines are to one another. So that can really help keep everything looking like it's it's from one piece. Actually, let's do one more. That doesn't quite seem long enough to me. Not have you guys watch me cut veneer all morning, because that's not that exciting. I mean, it's pretty exciting the way I do it, I know, but... Um, Alright, so this one, we're going to go back this way, right? We don't get out much, Owen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly these days. So I'm just going to mark my sides. I've got three seams here, so I'm going to go one, two, and three. So I can put these back together in the right order. And I like these, um, this is that, those pica pencils, those white pica pencils. I really like for dark veneers because you can actually see it where you can't with a regular um, pencil. Um, and I'm just going to... Um, we need to joint these edges a little bit. So I'm going to put this together in a packet. And tape this together. What was the name of that pencil? Pica. P-I-C-A. They come in these like hideous green holders. Casualty of teaching up in Maine, and I left those behind. It's on the woodcraft. Woodcraft? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. it's um, D I C A. They're weird size. They're like, like most pencils are, most lead holders are 2 mil. They're like 2.8 mil or something. <laughs> so you can't put them in a 2 mil lead holder. So I have to find a 3 millimeter lead holder because the, the their brand, like their branded lead holders, I. I'm vain and I think they're ugly and I don't want to be seen <laughs> holding one. <laughs> but that's just a weird thing that I have. You guys can, you know, so this, we all have our own obsessions, right? Um, so I'm just gonna, I could joint this. There's a bunch of different ways I could joint this depending on how much material I needed to remove. Um, you know what, I might actually make a quick cut. I really like these Gramercy veneer saws um, for a whole number of reasons. Um, so like the classic veneer saw, these guys here, the two cherries is the one that like everybody that starts veneering has. It's a decent saw. I find it's difficult to keep it square. There's not a lot of weight to it. I don't think it's a great quality of cut. Um, there's a bunch of ways you can do it with machines and if we were getting into that, I, I, you know, I'd be there's a, a lot, of, but for something this small, frankly, there's really very little point in getting into machine cutting. These Gramercy saws are great though, because A, they've got a ton of weight, they're really nice um, thickness blade, where there's a nice balance between how thick it is, and, um, and then they, they attach it to this big, thick piece of steel here, so it stays really stiff. Um, and I just find it's very, very easy to follow a straight edge. So I, I like this because it's got a, a little piece of sandpaper on there which kind of holds it in place. This is a little overkill for something. What's the name of this song? Grammar? Grammarcy? Oh, yeah. Grammarcy. I have one here that I brought for show and tell. I'll just ask Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this just, it just operates because it's got this flat side and you just drop that up against the, um, up against the straight edge there. Yeah and cut through that. 
and I usually find I can get a tapable edge right off of the saw, frankly. But if I can't for some reason, if I'm having a little trouble with it, I can just flip over to my sandpaper here and basically just use that as a, as a jointer and just joint that slightly. And that's usually, usually enough. So I'm just going to take up this other side here too. I've actually got a little split here, which is probably going to mess up our... Oh, and you sharpen that gramercy in your saw the same way as the two cherries? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. You can also send it back to them to sharpen. They, they, they sell three different grinds. This is the standard um, 60 degree, I think, I think it's the English grind. There's a French grind, <laughs> and then there's... The French one's real weird. I'll, I'll show you the... I don't like, some people apparently... There's a joke there somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I won't get into that. I'll leave that one be. But, um, so this one is just a standard 60 degree up and down. You know, the tooth looks like this. The French grind, um, if this is the saw blade, it has a slight, you know, curvature to it. All of the teeth on one side face that way, and then all the teeth on the other side face the other way, which apparently some people really like because it makes it a little, you know, there's, without getting too in the weeds on like the specifics of cutting veneer, there's, you know, if you're cutting across the grain on veneer and you get to this end, if you just go straight through, it, it can tear out basically, so you kind of have to go the other way. Supposedly that French grind makes it easier to do that because you've got the teeth going the other way and you can kind of flip it back. I do not personally find that to be the case. I find it to be a very frustrating saw to use. Um, but some pe I've talked to people that love it. So I, I think it's, you know, it's like a lot of things in woodworking. Like, it, you know, tr try both if you have the opportunity. And um, yeah, so Gramercy Tools. Um, they're down in New York. Tools for Working Wood, I think, is the website. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to take this pack together here. And I've got my layout lines. And I should have some decent edges at this point. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this the face with my layout line. So I'm actually going to start taping it from the other side. Um, and I like to use blue, just blue masking tape for most of my veneer taping. And this is where this, if this stuff isn't quite dry, this is where this can become a little problematic because the tape doesn't stick as well. Um, so we'll see how it works. So I'm just pulling this seam tight. And then I'm flipping it back over, kind of inspecting it. And then I'm going to run a piece of tape just down the seam on this side. And what I like to do is take a brass brush and just kind of burnish that a little bit. I find that that kind of sticks just a little bit better if I do that. And for now I'm going to leave that tape on the back just to kind of hold everything together. I have to remember to take it off before I press this though. Um, so. Actually, that's I got a little chunk out of that seam right there, so I'm going to um, trim that. Do you use veneer tape at all? Um, occasionally, just like a like a regular gum tape. Yeah. Um, I don't really use it very much, simply because I find it to be a bit of a pain to use, but it has its applications. Um, one of them being. It's much thinner than masking tape, so if I'm doing like a like a radial match kind of layout, um, where I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna have things crossing over one another, then I would probably opt to use it there because I, this stuff is a little too thick. If I were to cross it over, I'd be pressing now two layers of tape into the surface of the veneer, and that becomes a little problematic. So I, the you know, this is the. The gum tape, you can see how often I use it because this is covered in dust. Um, it comes in a couple different versions. 
Um, one is like a solid one and one has holes in it. Right. Um, the holes is so you can kind of see where it seams are and you can see what's going on a little bit more. And this is activated with water. You just, you, you wet it, um, usually with a, a sponge or a rag or something. Um, and once you wet it, it will stick to a surface. Yeah. And then to reactivate it, to remove it, you wet it again and peel it off. Realistically, though, that's it's not usually yeah, that's. Is the blue tape easier to remove though once you're done? I find it to be so. I mean, there's some nuances to that, and we can talk about that too. Um, uh, but in general, I find it a faster to apply, b faster to remove, and um, uh, just in general, I can kind of just keep working quicker. Um, whereas, like with the gum tape, you. Like I could, I could tape this together and I could throw it right in the bag. Technically with the gum tape, you really need to wait for that to dry completely before you can put it into the bag because the, the way that the theory on this, and to some extent I, I agree with it, is when you wet this, it kind of slightly expands. You put it across the joint and then as it dries, it kind of shrinks and it pulls that joint together. What I like about this blue tape is it has some inherent stretch to it. So you can kind of do the same thing by pulling it across the seam. And you'll see, I'll, I'll kind of exaggerate it a little bit here, but um, we'll tape this guy together. You know, if I pull this across the seam here, don't you wait on one side, I want to do it on this side. And there are other tapes that are even stretchier than this if I've got something that's problematic or I'm using it as a clamp, but you can see like I've pulled it tight, so it's actually doing this little thing because it's tighter on that side than that side now. Um, and I just put a little piece down here. But yeah, so this, I found this stuff pretty recently, which I guess luthiers really use like, like a lot, and this stuff is, is crazy how much this stuff stretches. I mean, you can like really stretch it out and then it'll snap back. So like if you're using this to like clamp on bandings and stuff, this stuff's amazing. It's like three times the price of this, but <laughs> it's a good one. This is, they sell it at um, Lee Valley, but I found that you can get it a lot cheaper um, other places. Sanimal carries it. Who does? Sanimal. Oh, okay, yeah. I just found, I think I got uh, like a 12 pack on Amazon, but it's the, it's the 233 plus uh, scotch. It's great. Stuff is good. The Terry's uh, recommendation on uh, on just plain old veneer tape is the cheesiest, you know, sort of Manila masking tape that you can find because the glue's relatively weak. Yeah. It's, it both it stretches, so it'll hold the joint long enough to, to get it done, and then it just wave a heat <clears throat> gun over it for for a second. Yep. And it comes right off. And that's, I do a similar thing with this. I, just, I actually use an iron and it kind of just softens the glue slightly and you can peel it right off. Um, yeah, I, I just find that it's so frustrating to work with that masking tape sometimes because it always gets stuck to the roll. And so you're like half, I feel like you're half the time you're spending like getting a new edge because it's like torn off. <laughs> so, um, and I just use the blue tape as like the duct tape of the woodworking shop. I just use it for oh, yeah. so many things. Yeah. I just always have a roll hand. So um, I, I've just ended up kind of using that. But yeah, that, the masking tape, I remember years ago when I first joined the guild, you know, and I remember getting my first issue of the journal, and I believe there was an article from Terry Moore in there about that exact thing, that the using the cheapest masking tape. Um, I've also used packing tape, frankly, and that's, that'll work too. The problem I found with the packing tape is that you can really, like, embed the the adhesive from that into the into your work. All right. So I've got my piece here that we're going to veneer onto this, um, and I think what I'm going to do is so I need to decide where I want my waterfall edge, basically. And uh, I think I'm going to start by squaring up one edge of this. <coughs> Let's see. Actually, actually, I want to use take this. Grab this. Okay. 
I wish I had a smaller one now. No matter how much bench space you have, it's never enough, right? <laughs> um, all right, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by squaring an edge up here. And I might, you know, if we had a little bit more time, if I were doing this for real, I might be somewhat inclined to glue these seams, even in a commercial veneer. I do find that kind of, like, once you start asking it to curve and whatnot, Having those seams pre-glued does actually provide some level of um, protection to that opening up. I'm not going to bother here because it adds a, another thing that we have to get through, but um, I might consider it. So I'm just going to uh, trim this off. Ah, shit. See, that's what I mean about like that. Um, that uh, pulling that through. I thought I'd nick that, but I guess I didn't nick it enough. Yeah, exactly. You gotta get the French one. So I'm gonna pull this back together and we will move on. I like your straight edge there. Yeah, this is, I mean, this I use this for a ton of different things. I mean, even just for like, sometimes I'll just clamp it to that bench and use it as a fence for yeah. things, you know? Yeah. It's super useful. What's it made out of? Um, it's just a piece of maple. Oh, just a scrap piece of maple. And, and I, I buy these rolls of this PSA sandpaper, so I, I, I keep it in 150 and 120 grits. Super useful for tons of stuff. Um, but it's it's in this case it's multi-purpose because it kind of helps it from sliding around a little bit. Plus, like I said, I can use it as a jointing plane, basically. Yeah. Um, I just I haven't finished it yet, but one of the things we did with the students when I was up in Maine, the other guy I was teaching with makes these shooting planes, veneer shooting planes. So I like made a plane. I haven't. That's all cut out for for the blade and. I, Got the blade, but I haven't finished it yet. But so, if we if we do something else here again, I'll be able to report back on whether that is a uh, a good way to go. But all right, so I just need to finish this little edge because it kind of tore it. This is a good place for a knife. Come in here and just kind of work that off. Even with a softener, this um, Macassar is pretty brutal. I actually, I had forgotten where this, this is a scrap piece left over some veneer that I bought from, um, um, from Jerry Osgood, and it's actually slightly thicker. It's an older veneer, and it's a little bit thicker than commercial veneers now, so, um, and I'd forgotten. This is, uh, I used most of this on a table I built a few years ago. Um, all right, so I've got a, a square edge now. I'm gonna call that my top edge. And I know I need, what do I want to get here? I want, I'm going to say two and, if I go two and a quarter, I'm in a pretty good spot. So I'm going to lay out two and a quarter here. And this is going to be the cutoff for my waterfall edge. Two and a quarter. Oh, and before I do this, I'm going to put some triangles across that line so I know how to put this back together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's obvious, and then sometimes it really isn't. Um, so I'm going to use a knife for this because I was not terribly successful with a saw. So. I really like these alpha knives for this kind of stuff because you can it's really easy to get a fresh blade <clears throat> we need to get links for all the tools you mentioned oh, wow. i yeah so i have a, a 
resource, well I have a couple of things going. I've got a resource list that I give to people when I've been teaching and I can certainly send that to you Elliot. Yeah, Maybe you great. can yeah. disseminate that. The other thing I have that's become harder to find, I think um, Amazon changed their, the way their lists work last year and I have a wish list on Amazon that's got all of the stuff that I talk about in various workshops on it, that, at least stuff you can get through Amazon. Um, and it used to be you could just do a search through their platform for that list and you would find it, but apparently that doesn't work anymore. So I can send you a direct link to the list, but I can't just have you search it. So I, I'll send uh, you a yeah, link yeah. and I'll send you that resource list. Hopefully you get a bump for all searches on that. Or yeah. <laughs> I, I do not have that kind of a partnership going oh, with okay. it, <laughs> unfortunately. So you're not like Tom McLaughlin. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, so this is going to be my waterfall edge. It looks like part of it just broke off, so I'm actually going to take that back together. This is where this stuff gets super fussy. You start getting little pieces that break off. Yeah, this stuff is pretty brittle. Even though I softened it yesterday, it's still being a little problematic. All right, so we're going to put this aside somewhere safe, which is going to be, I'll put it in the store right here. <laughs> With the pencils. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so I just want to double check that this is going to, you know, I'm not overhanging anywhere. And I'm going to shoot for this line. I'm not going to worry about it too, too much because I can, I can kind of square it up after, after I've veneered it. Um, any questions so far, or thoughts, or observations, or we're all good? All right. So why don't we, um, we'll press this, and while that's in the vacuum bag, this is starting to dry, we can get back and talk to the, do this for a bit, and then maybe we'll take a little bit of a break, and, um, and then we'll come back and, and do the rest of this and, and this. Uh, all right, so I am going to pull the tape off the back of this now. This is very important that this be done. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> uh, ever put finish on a beautiful tabletop and then two weeks later these little ridges start showing up and you can't figure out why? <laughs> Are you kidding? Aha! Uh -huh. That's the exact same size and shape as a piece of tape. <laughs> the surgeon leaves his uh, clamps in the... Yeah, the exactly. Side. Yeah, same idea. Um, Alright, so for this we're going to use the Type Bond 1. And... Um, and we're going to do it over there, so... Um, so maybe we can kind of spin around and gather around. I'll glue it at that gurney and then pop it into the vacuum bag there. So who wants me to kind of go the up? Okay, so let's just real quick. So um, basically the concept of a vacuum pressing system is um, you've got a vacuum pump that is you know basically the opposite of, of a um, like an air compressor where it's instead of pushing air into the system, it's pulling the air out of the system and then you've got a sealed bag and once you've pulled all the air out of that bag you've created not a perfect vacuum but a vacuum and so there's now a difference in pressure between what's happening inside the bag and then the, the column, the air pressure column on top of it. Um, so you are able to distribute that weight of the air column over that piece very, very evenly. So it's a really, really nice way of flattening, of veneering large panels, um, things, something you couldn't get uh, clamps to, basically. Um, so if you're doing like a lot of veneering or a lot of bent lamination work, it's a really, really great system. And it's, it's two parts. It's a pump of some kind and a bag of some kind. Um, years ago, when I first started doing this, I built uh, one of these guys, which some of you guys probably have, something looks very similar. Um, this is like the classic Joe Woodworker vacuum yep. 
pump. Um, it's a really good system. It's gone through a lot of iterations since I built this. I built this in about 2005. The newer ones are a little bit better because now there's filters in the system that weren't there originally. One thing I cannot figure out about this system are these two tanks. I think are completely useless. I don't understand. Like the theory is, is that it's holding the vacuum, but I think that's bogus. I don't. Not with a bag that big. There's just there's not I, exactly. Volume. So, so I think you could build this whole system without any of that. Right. I mean, because there's no tank inside this. I right. mean, this is just this right. basically, and this stuff. And these are the, the commercial ones that are sold by again Daryl Keel's company up in Maine, back compressing systems. I, this works great, frankly, it's just so slow that I, it took me, like I, what I used to have to do is hook a, a, a shop vac up to the bag, pull all the air out, like, and then hook this up so they could actually pull the vacuum. And I just got so sick of that, so I finally broke down about a year or so ago and, and bought this, and I don't regret it at all. Um, I, it's awesome. Did you buy it new? I did, yeah. yeah. What was, how much did it cost? It was about $900 plus shipping, so I th it's just shy of a grand by the time you... This is the, the, there's three sizes, and this is the middle size. There's a bigger one that has more, uh, you know, more CFM, so it pulls a vacuum faster. And there's a smaller one. I've used all three in various places, and I kind of decided the smaller one wasn't quite powerful enough, the big one was frankly more than I needed for what I do. Um, so I went with this one. And then I've added a couple of upgrades to it. I added a manifold so I can run two bags off of it at once, because um, I do, sometimes do stuff in a smaller bag, um, uh, which is what we're gonna use actually for that, um, that small panel. So I have a manifold so I can swap between bags, and I also have a foot switch that turns it off and on, um, which I really like, because when I'm doing curved stuff sometimes, it's really nice to be able to stop the vacuum so you can kind of manipulate the bag a little bit and then kick it back on again. So I really like that as, a, as an add-on to the system. But it's definitely not necessary. Um, if you notice, it's really quiet. Yeah, it's crazy how quiet it is. Yeah. Um, and this, I mean, it's crazy how fast this cycles too compared to this guy. Um, so a couple main things you need to have in a, in a vacuum bag. You gotta have some way of moving the air out from underneath the workpiece. Usually that's done with a platen of some kind that's got grooves in it, um, and that allows the air to move. When we do it without a platen, we're gonna use a breather mesh, basically, that, that takes the place of the platen and allows the air to move around the workpiece. But you gotta have some way of actually moving that air out, otherwise it just gets trapped, you know. If you just put something in the bag, turn it on, it's just going to trap on itself and you're not really creating a vacuum at that point. So. And then from, from my workflow, I keep a full-size lower call in here as well that I can just slide out and I usually have like a roller stand here that I can slide this whole thing out, load work onto it, and then slide the whole thing back in. But you don't necessarily need that, you do need to have something well, you don't always need to have something like, in this case, I could actually probably put this directly on the platen and I'd be fine. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put it on, on, on this. But, um, and then for most work, particularly for flat work, you usually have some kind of a call on the top. Turn this up. Um, Usually you have some kind of call on the top that does a couple of things. It distributes the pressure a little bit better. It also protects the veneer. You, you'll find that you know, there's th those veneers, they're so delicate. I mean, you saw how many times I ended up tearing that thing apart. What can happen is if you've got nothing between the bag itself and the veneer, and it's moving across the surface of the veneer, it can tear the veneer. So the top call kind of prevents that as well. Um, <coughs> So usually we would have a top call. In this case, we're not going to have a top call because it's curved. So what I'm going to use to do a couple of things, one, protect the veneer, and two, distribute the weight a little bit, is I really like yoga mats. Um, don't really care for yoga very much, but yoga mats are awesome. <laughs> um, and these are super useful because, like, obviously it's flexible, it's a little bit stiff. Um, it's actually, it's an open um, cell 
material so the air will actually move through the piece, which can be really useful sometimes depending on what it is you're, you're doing. So I usually have pieces of yoga mat. Um, the other thing I've found that can be useful sometimes <laughs> is this stuff here. It's like a 16th inch vinyl material that's kind of stretchy. And they sell this as a luthier supply website that I found this from. And they call it a, um, a pressing membrane. Mem membrane? Membrane? Does that sound right? <laughs> um, and this is pretty good too. I've, I've, I just found this a few months ago and I've been playing around with it a little bit and it's, it's pretty useful. But, but the yoga mat worked great and honestly it's much easier to find. Um, you can go down at TJ Maxx, they always have them on sale. So I'm going to, but I don't want to put this directly against the workpiece um, because, well, you can see what can happen actually if it gets stuck to the glue. So I'm going to put a piece of plastic in between the veneer and, and this guy. I'm actually going to cut this slightly so that I'm not fighting it. And of course I didn't bring glue, which is like the most important part, so I'm going to grab that real quick. And then I like to just make sure everything's ready to go here. I mean, if I'm doing like a big like tabletop move, something where it's like if I fail on this, it's it's a nightmare. I'll do a test run, I'll seal the bag up, I'll make sure it's pulling a vacuum, there's no problems anywhere. Um, you know, in this I just gotta make sure that I'm in fact on the right one, which I am. Um, so I'm pulling air out of this bag, not that bag. And we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna put a couple little pencil ticks here because I don't really need to glue this whole thing, I just need to glue under the veneer. Probably, this is a small enough piece that that becomes less problematic. But on a big piece, if you have too much glue, you get these little pools, and there isn't enough pressure in the system to push those pools out. So what ends up happening is you get these little ridges where the glue pools, um, and that's not great. It is less than ideal. In this case, I'm not so worried about it, but. So this could be done, I mean realistically there's a bunch of different ways you could do this if you don't have a vacuum bag. You could do it, um, you could make a call that is the, the opposite shape of that and you could you know, clamp it in place and in some ways that's actually a really good way of doing it. In some ways you have a little bit more control frankly doing it that way. Um, so I'm just going to tape this in place in a few places. I'm shooting to hit this line, but I'm also not going to stress out over it too much because, like I said, I have some flexibility in my, my ability. Where this becomes a little bit more of an issue is if I've got multiple pieces of this and I want to line up the, like I'm doing a miter, you know, yeah. then it becomes a little bit more of an issue. Um, so I try to make my, my piece long enough that I can do ideally the whole run in one piece just so that I'm not dealing with multiple shapes. If for some reason that's not practical, if it's a long piece, um, then I might, um, I might 
you know, be a bit more careful, or before I cut everything to the final width, just kind of make sure we're all in agreement, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna put that over there, that over there, and then I'm actually gonna tape this whole thing together. Is that just to prevent it from sliding off? Yeah, it just, it back? gets, it can get really hairy sometimes in the bag. Um, so I, I try to kind of keep everything, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you're just trying to control the system as much as possible. There. This is where I usually hit my head, and this guy right here. I, I do that more. I, I should probably just put like a piece of foam or something over it. Or find a better place for the vacuum bag, but it's kind of, it's, it's a, this is a decent spot because I can't really use it for too many other things because of the electrical stuff. How <laughs> was yeah, helmet. My my back bag <laughs> helmet. <laughs> All right, so I fire this off, and then I just kind of I just want to sort of control a little bit what the bag is going to do at this point. Let that cool down a bit. This is what the, the tanks and. The Setup are supposed to do is to give you some, an immediate pull on some of the air in the bag. So the bag is big. It's this is where I might turn that off and just kind of smooth out in there because you know I'm trying to pull that down into that um, into the cavity of that OG. So I might just kind of do a little work to. You know, I'd rather it cheat that way a little bit than pull it back. And sometimes, depending on what I'm doing, I might even have like a roller or something here, and I'm kind of manipulating that with a roller. I wonder if you could you know, sort of wave a, a heat gun over it. Let it kind of get a little bit more pliable as, as you're pulling it down. Maybe. I mean, I I find so there's two different materials that make these bags out of. See this thing is like right in the wrong. Oh man. Um, there's two different materials that make these bags out of. There's a vinyl and then there's a polyurethane material. And the vinyl is a little bit more rigid. Um, the polyurethane, I find on curved stuff, it really pulls down into the. And you know, depending on the shape. One of the things you can do is you can raise that slightly so you've got a little bit more of an off-ramp for the bag to pull down. So on certain things, I usually recommend put some shins, you know, attach that to a block or something so it's raised. And for this, I don't think it's, it's necessary, but for, I'll show you some stuff I'm working on now and, and I figured the only way I can do that is to actually get it higher so the bag can actually pull down around the edges, otherwise I'm not getting enough adhesion. Um, so this is that point in any veneering thing where you just kind of have to assume that everything's going well in there and there are no problems. <laughs> and we just let that sit for a bit. How long? Um, so for this, for today, I'm going to just pull it out when it's... When, oh, there's our stuff. Um, uh, actually, let me go turn that I, For curved things, I usually recommend like an hour or so. Um, depending on how severe the curve is. I mean, realistically, I could open that bag without consequence probably in 20 to 25 minutes, but I wouldn't necessarily want to take it out at that time. I could slide another piece in there in 25 minutes without consequence, but I think I'd want it to, I'd want it to cook in there for 45 minutes to an hour before taking it out, realistically. Yeah, perfect. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're flattening this, uh, Use calls. To yeah. So like I said, use that well, mat, that black. Uh, yeah. So you kind of because of the yeah, glue, there. you yeah. have to use something in between. The idea is we're going to um, introduce paper, various changes of paper to try to pull the moisture right. back out of the piece. Yeah. Um, but because of the glue, you got to put something between right. the paper and the piece. Otherwise, you're just going to glue paper to it. Um, and the most common thing to use is just a, um, a plastic window screen yeah. mesh, um, which as you have correctly yeah, noted, see, yeah. there's you, what you end up with because of the glue is you end up with a little imprint 
what I have found is when you, after you have pressed this and then you go to card scrape this to clean it up, I've never not been able to remove that mm -hmm. um, because it's basically just little ridges of glue and you can just scrape that right off. So, um, so I've, I've not ever had a problem with that. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of hammer veneering here with the, the pieces that we um, glued up earlier. Like I said, I find this to be an unbelievably useful technique. Um, Parts because it allows you to do some things that you re really, really hard to do any other way. Um, it's also just like really low tech. I mean, all you need is an iron. I mean, this like this is a super. I've used this iron for years. I think I paid 25 bucks for it or something. I was just saying, I I, I put a fancy iron on my Christmas list um, this year, and, and I, I, I my mom bought me this. So and this is the first time I've used it. I haven't actually done any hammer veneering with it since I got it. So I'm kind of excited to try it out. But um, yeah, I know, right? And what I really liked about it is it's got this point, you know, rather than so I, I figure I can get in some tighter spots and whatnot. Um, so this dashboard system I was showing a few of you guys, this is the interior for a, a Jaguar, 55 Jag. Almost all of those parts are hammer veneered. Um, and, and that was really one of the only ways to kind of, because I had to fold the veneer down over these edges. And, and like I said, I, I mean, I'm sure traditionally when this was originally done in the 50s, it would have been done with hide glue. I just straight up don't like hide glue. I find it a pain in the ass to work with. So I, I approached it this way. Um, so I have, most, most of the time if I'm doing like flat surfaces or stuff I can get to, I just use a regular iron here. I also have this little detail iron, which is for um, like model making. It's got this little curved shoe. And this thing's great for like getting into these little guys here and getting into little tight corners. Um, there's also another shoe for this that's, that's got like a point, it's flat with a point, that's pretty useful too. Um, so that's a nice little doohickey and fairly cheap. The only thing I don't like about this is you end up kind of pressing pretty hard and um, I have a feeling it's just a matter of time before I break this probably, but um, it wasn't that expensive. So I usually find, so you don't have to have this. Well, that iron, I find I kind of have to crank it all the way up. Um, so I am about 150 on this right now. Which is, I mean, in theory, that's probably warm enough. I'm just going to crank it up a little bit, though. Um, there's kind of, I, I found that even though technically there's a temperature that this glues at. Everything just kind of goes a little bit faster if you have it a little bit hotter. So uh, I'm going to bump it up just a touch. Um, yeah. Have you, uh, I've been thinking about trying to use a heat gun. Have you ever tried that? I don't, would it get hot enough? Oh, no, they get hot. Yeah. 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 Some, yeah. some of them have, are 1,500 watts. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, then in theory, I suppose so. I mean, I guess the, the thing that you're doing with the iron is you were you are both applying the heat and starting that process of, you know, actually hammering it and, and, and moving that, you know, that out. So um, you, you would, if you were using a heat gun, you would sort of need to use it in conjunction with something else, a, ham, a veneer hammer or, um, uh, veneer hammer. Um, so this process is basically one of reactivating the glue kind of flattening it down and then using something to then remove the heat from that because the what what will happen is if I you know if you were to just press this heat the glue up and then take that iron off it's probably just going to peel off again frankly because that glue is still hot so there's no bond there um, you can use a traditional veneer hammer, which is usually some. It's usually a piece of steel. Um, this is one that I made years ago, frankly, before I really knew what a veneer hammer did. So it's got like a thin piece of aluminum in it, um, which is useful for like getting really direct pressure to something. And I still use it quite a bit, but it doesn't doesn't do anything to act as a heat sink. Um, I came across this guy, which is a um, it's a seam roller for rubber roofing. And it's like a big chunk of steel, and it's um, it's a roller, which is nice. Um, so that works really well to both, you know, 
continue applying pressure, but also to act as that heat sink. The other thing I found that like works really well um, is just like a piece of steel. So like when I was doing this guy in here, I was using the detail iron and then using that as a as a both a sink and a roller to pull that heat away and kind of flatten that out. So just a piece of steel works. Um, and it's not really so much about applying a ton of pressure at that point. It's more about again like pulling the heat away and just a, a keeping some kind of even pressure on that. Um, so you will find that this stuff tacks off pretty quickly. So usually what I do, I'm going to just do a quick one on this flat guy and then we'll, we'll see if we can make this work. Hopefully it won't be a total disaster. Um, uh, so usually what I, I, I do is I'll, I'll just tack a corner and you'll find that that's already kind of just tacked off a little bit. Yeah, these are the ones that we did earlier this morning. No, I just, uh, so, yeah, so this, this is the stuff that we glued earlier, so it's dry to the touch now, and you can kind of, it gets a little shiny, and there's some spots where it was a little bit thicker, where it's not quite dry yet, particularly on this guy, um, but that's it, it's just the glue that we put on earlier, and, and it, it does need to be on both surfaces, you know, unlike when we only glued one surface for that, this does need to be on both surfaces, it's almost like a contact cement in that way. Um, so just without anything else, it's already tacked. Probably I could peel that off if I really wanted to, or if I put a little bit more heat onto it. Um, but it, it very well might tear. So it's it's not, you know, there's not a lot to it. But what I can kind of do now is, like, if I were shooting for a specific, and this is one of the reasons I like this technique for doing detail stuff, where it really matters where I get stuff lined up, is I can tack a corner, and then I can kind of shifty this around until I get it exactly where I want, and then tack another corner you know, and kind of check everything. And then I can just go back and iron that whole thing down. Oh, I love the new iron, it's sweet. <laughs> yeah, and once that's down, I can just start rolling that out. And again, I'm just trying to get that temperature back down and pull some of that heat off. And you'll usually, you know, I can already tell that that's, that's probably dropped below, you know, 100 degrees. Where did you get that roller, Owen? Um, Amazon. It's, yeah. for, uh, it's for roll rubber roofing, roof. for rubber roofing. It's yeah. a seam roller. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's actually one, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Scott Grove at all. He's out in, geez, I don't know, Ohio maybe. Um, he teaches a lot of veneering stuff. He teaches a Mark Adams and... This, um, during COVID, he started doing these Sunday afternoon, like Zoom workshop things that were like 10 bucks, they were great. And I, I jumped into a bunch of them because it's like, oh, Sunday afternoon during like the hi height of COVID, there was nothing else to do, so. Um, and I, you know, this is something that he was using. I was like, oh, that's brilliant. I love that thing, so. His name is Scott Grove. Yeah, he's got a book, it's a really classic, veneering book called um, Advanced Veneering Techniques. It's where I first came across some of this stuff, this veneer softening stuff, and he does a lot of compound curve things, and he's pretty wild. He's an interesting guy. I've met him a couple of times. Um, like, he, he teaches the veneering courses at Mark Adams, and every year Mark challenges him to veneer something crazy, so he veneered a bowling ball one year, one year he veneered a light bulb. Um, like, he's pretty wild. Um, and a lot of this stuff, a lot of like this stuff, the stuff I, well, I was already doing this before I started, but not so much for the compound stuff, but for the flat stuff I was already using it. Like when I first built this actually, um, this table, the first iteration of this table that I built, I hammer veneered this, all this molding. Rather than having it as two pieces that I attached, I actually did it as one piece, um, a solid, um, uh, quarter saw on top that I molded the edge and then hammer veneered it with, with this. Um, and I decided about halfway through that that was not the right way to do it, which is why in subsequent iterations I've done it as a two-part thing because it's much faster, frankly. Um, so that's, that's basically it. At this point I could kind of 
go through here and what tends to happen so see I've got a little spot there where like the, the corner isn't quite adhered the beauty of this system is I can just now go back and just apply a little bit more heat a little bit more pressure to that point and roll that out a little bit and now that is glued right on there so it's really handy sometimes what I'll find is even like pressing stuff in the vacuum bag if I didn't quite get you know I got glue coverage out at the edges but maybe it didn't quite push out as much as I wanted it took me a little bit longer to get it in the bag than I expected I can go around the edge of something with an iron you know I can, I've even gone so far as to like take you know just take a knife and get just force some more glue into that edge and then go back around with the iron and and hit that edge because that's really like that for veneered surface as long as you've got decent adhesion in the, the field here you know you've got no bubbles where I get more concerned about something breaking off is because I didn't quite get perfect adhesion at that edge and if that breaks then it, you know that can chase into the rest of the piece so um, I think it's a pretty good practice in general just to to go out I may not have gotten oh you know what why I'm not getting great adhesion on the edges it's because I had tape, so I didn't get glue on the edges of the... I just got glue on the edges of the... Um, so, I guess maybe that's an argument against that system. If your piece is exactly the same size as what you're veneering, you can either touch up a little glue on that edge after you peel the tape off, or go with the spray, you know, spray. Or oversize it. So, or oversize it. If you oversize that, and it's, it's basically a, uh, a, a saw question, do you pre-score that so it doesn't chip out or do you just flip it? Depending on, what size it, yeah, depending on how big of a piece it is, I actually find the easiest way to, if assuming this is possible and it isn't always, but like let's say I'm working on something even if it's this big, I'll just flip it over so the veneer is face down and then take a sharp knife and I can just score that edge and just clean it up. And then usually it's still a little rough, and what I typically do at that point is I use a little file. Yep. But if you wanted to take a half inch off that, if I oh off the whole thing? Yeah, if you, you oversized it. And yeah, you know, um, it depends. It. If it was a straight cut, and I could just run it through the table saw, I'd just run it through the table saw. Um, if both sides are veneered, you know, I'd, I'd probably set it up with a um, some kind of a zero clearance throat plate situation, like I will typically on something like that, I'll actually take a sheet of eighth inch MDF and double stick that tape, that to the surface of the table saw and then punch the blade up through it. So I've essentially got this like perfectly flat, zero clearance table at that point. And that gives you a slightly cleaner cut. And then, you know, blade choice. And um, I generally don't get into pre-scoring things simply because I find it really difficult to line up that with like where I'm actually gonna cut it. And if you, you know, you either end up being in the wrong place on one side or the other of where you've scored it, and if you're on the inside of it, your scoring's done nothing, and if you're on the outside of it, now you've got a knife line in your work. Um, so I tend not to do that, but it can it can work. Also, just you know, sometimes even something as simple as you know, a piece of tape on there yep. will will help a little bit. I mean, usually with the grain, it's not terribly problematic. It's across the grain where it becomes it becomes an issue. And I do, a, I mean, I've, I'm lucky, I have a big sliding table saw with a cross, you know, with a really nice cross cut blade in it, so I can usually manage that sort of stuff on the, you know, on square stuff it's not too difficult. I, where I find it to be more complicated is when you get into curved stuff and now am I cutting with a router or am I, um, but so, yeah, I mean, it depends on the piece, but does that kind of answer that question? Cool. Um, any other thoughts on, on that? We'll, we'll give this a whirl and see how this works. Um, so I think the first thing I'm going to do is maybe trim off some of this. What I found coming around curves, so what's going to happen is as I come over this, like I'm going to create some pleats, right? Um, and the less material I have um, beyond where I'm trying to get to, the smaller those pleats are going to be. So I usually try to pre-trim that as much as possible. Um, 
So we're going to trim some of this material off and um, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try some of these out. I just when I was up at the uh, CFC, I had a um, one of the, the facilities. The head of the facilities there, this guy named Mark Giuliana. He's really into like digital stuff. He has a 3D printer, so I had him print me out these little blocks that I can put a Pica pencil into, and then use it to to scribe curved surfaces, and they all have different offsets, so I have everything from a sixteenth all the way up to five eighths of an oh. inch. Um, so I am going to see, I need to come down that much, I'm going to try the biggest one actually. That might not work on this. Three side. millimeter holes? Yeah, exactly. We, try, we tried, actually I think it's slightly more than three mil, we tried three mil and the, the pica didn't quite fit through there, so he bumped it up to like 3.4 or something. Um, This will be. This is the maiden voyage of my. Uh, <laughs> if this, uh, if these work, I'm going to market these. So pat patent pending. <laughs> patent pending. Money. Even better than donuts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's something you can get, honestly. But I was like, oh, since I'm here, this seems like this would be really easy for you to make, and I would love it. Regardless, well, this stuff is like crazy brittle at this point, but um, but no, you can you can um, and if stuff is like I can cut across the grain in pretty much anything. What you'll find is if you try to cut with the grain, it tends to fall into a grain line, and it, it'll follow that. So it's not as useful for um, for cutting with the grain. I mean, if if you've got straight grain and you're, you're following the grain direction, you can rough stuff. But I can get you know, decent roughing cuts across the grain. So it's usually, if I'm bucking up a sheet of veneer for processing, I would usually cut it to rough size with these. These are great, because they're an old pair of tailor shears and they've got like a hollow grind to the blade, so they're really easy to sharpen just on a stone. They're really, really nice. I think I found them at a, a flea market for like four bucks or something. Um, all right, so I just need to make sure that I give myself enough material here. So I'll make sure I've got a good starting point. So I think I'll just be, be safe. We'll start right there. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by tacking it just in the center here. Start by tacking this here. And I'm going to let the rest hang for now. It'll probably, I'm going to clamp this just so I can hold it and I might actually put some pressure on it. But I'm going to start at the top and I'm just going to kind of work it down towards the edge here and see what happens. Is C okay? Okay. Well, what I'm going to kind of do here is is actually tack it in a few places rather than try to work it all the way down. of this guy yet. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that's so much hotter at the tip. That didn't occur to me. Yeah, I'm running like over 200 degrees at the tip. So I'm gonna... Um, you know, this is kind of like... There is a point here where it's nice to have the temperature pretty controlled because if I get it too hot, it just takes too long to tack. You know what I mean? So I'm gonna tack it in a few spots. 
What's the ideal temp? 150? Um, yeah, I usually find somewhere around 150 is pretty good. Um, once you get over that, like I said, it just starts to, um, starts to be a little problematic. So I think we're fine with this curve. I actually think I maybe even could have gone a little bit more. So I've got these pleats here. Um, so I, I don't know if you guys are sort of familiar with the concept of like steam bending wood. And when you steam bend wood, you use a compression strap. And the reason for that is, you know, wood will it'll stretch. It will only stretch about two percent of its length. So if you're if you're going around a bend, right, you are asking that piece of wood to either get shorter on the inside or get longer on the outside. And it'll only get longer on the outside by about two percent. But it has an ability to. To, for those wood fibers to slide past each other, in some species as much as 15%, so like ash and oak in particular, that's why they're so good for bending, those, those fibers will slide past each other an enormous amount. This is the exact same concept, so I've got these pleats here, now I can use that concept that wood will compress a lot, excuse me, compress a lot more than it will stretch um, to compress those pleats basically. So what I've done now is I've created these little spots where I've got to now compress that material. And I think that that will work with these. At least on the surface that we care about. So at some point would you have to make a slice? Yeah, well, Yes, you can do that, and that is one way to manage it. There is, you know, I am, I am by no means the expert in this technique, um, but my understanding from reading other things and talking to other people and listening to other people talk about this is you can usually compress, it depends on the species, but over an inch you can compress a quarter inch complete, um, I believe is what I have been told. Um, that depends species to species. Some species will compress more than others. So, you know, if, if you are doing a specific thing, then you might want to do some experimentation, frankly, and see what works. But, um, uh, and then beyond that, you have two choices. You either have to, you have to seam it somewhere then. So you either would seam it. So if, um, if I were trying to, like, the bowling ball at Scott, Veneer, Scott Rowe veneer, the way he did that is he basically figured out the point of the curve that he could no longer compress those pleats and then he just seamed it around the curve. So, so that bowling ball was a total of maybe five pieces or something that were all seamed together. Um, and that tends to work a little bit better than putting a, what happens if you put a slice in and then try to bring that together is depending on the species that may or may not look right. Um, Yeah, like I said, there's a reason why cars are usually done in burl walnut, because burl walnut has an incredible ability to stretch and compress and... on the bottom here before I'm hitting my seam. Flip this around and see if I can get that to work. I've probably got a little bit more material than I need here. I, I, I got a little nervous I wasn't going to have enough. And I think it would be like, I could, I could remove some of this material at this point and it would probably um, make my life a little bit easier. Could you do the same technique with cherry? Um, probably, I mean, yes, but I don't think you'd be able to bend it quite as much, you know? And you'll find that once you've got, like, the nice thing about burl is you just don't have to think about grain, really. Um, whereas, um, like, if you're trying to do this with something where you're working either with the grain or across the grain, you're going to get a different set of results. So it is something that is, is, is uniquely suited to a burl veneer, specifically. Specifically. Um, 
so a couple things going on here. I'm not quite getting as much adhesion right at the seam as I'd like. And I've got a little bit too much material there. So I think at this point, probably what I would do is I would very carefully try to remove some of this material. And then I would probably just try to apply a little bit more glue at that seam line and then just keep working that down, if that makes sense. But I, you know, I'm pretty sure with a little bit more work, I could get to the point where I could just clean that, that seam up. And then up top here, I actually maybe made a mistake by tacking that. Um, Cause now I gotta deal with these pleats here, which we'll see if I can do. I probably shouldn't have tacked that, frankly. Will it come up? Well, it was, and then I hit a spot where it started to tear. And I, I probably, you know, I very well might, if I was very, very careful, I might be able. It would, yeah, I'm just trying to find, find the right spot, and then trying to come at it from the right direction here. And then, maybe heat that up a little bit. To, oh no, that's starting to tear. I mean, if I really wanted to be fussy about it, I could probably get that to come back up, but it's a little tedious to watch me mess around with that for 10 minutes, so instead I'm just gonna see if I can um, press these pleats down, which I may or may not be able to. too much on this corner. I don't think I'm going to be able to deal with it. It is remarkable how much this stuff will stretch. Though. So I think, yeah, if I were doing this for real, I probably would have tried to pull that up. And I think tacking that here to begin with is probably a mistake. In, in reality, I probably should have just tacked it right here. And then, that's why like, I would highly recommend when you start getting into this kind of stuff, just do some tests like, before you start doing it on the real deal. Because you will find, like, I built, an I built another dashboard and practice. Like, there's one of my practices up there, actually. <laughs> because I was, I, you know, I, it's like, well, I've kind of got one shot at this, and I know it's going to take me a while to figure this out, so... Um, so anything like yeah. this, I always recommend that you do a few, a few test runs so you can really dial in the process. And I might be able to, yeah, I mean a lot of this I can definitely take out, I think, if I keep working at it. I mean, that's actually not bad. But the one place I lost it. is just at these two corners here. I just wasn't able to get that to come around quite enough. But I think at about there, it's actually, it's fine. I think if I'd started here, then worked out, and then brought it back, that would have that would have worked. So in general, like, not bad. Like I said, I think that's probably the tightest radius I've done on that, so. Um, I guess the, Upshot on this is, is this, I think this is a really useful power, if, even if all you're doing is using it as a way to fix little things here and there in your veneer work, I just think it's a super useful technique to have in your arsenal. Um, any further questions on that before we move on to something else? How do you clean the surface of the iron? Um, well, I generally don't, actually, as you can see <laughs> from the one that is okay. probably 10 years old at this point. I think this is the one I bought when I first did this table, which was 2012, I think, so it's 10 years old. They fill an iron cleaner. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could probably, I mean, every once in a while I'll get like some gunk on it and I'll just scrape it off and then maybe hit it with like a 220 sandpaper or something, but in general I, I don't really worry about it too much. Um, and if it's, you know, if it's a light veneer, um, you know, I, I tend to work a lot with like, for this sort of stuff in darker veneers, but if it's a really light veneer, 
you might want to think a little bit about whether or not that's going to stain, and you might want to put something in between the iron and the, you know, um, uh, either a piece of fabric maybe, or I mean, even a piece of paper <clears throat> might work. Something because you can definitely like, I have had that happen on 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 you know lighter maples and anagrays and things like that where you can sort of stain the stain it a little bit as you're manipulating like the I don't know it just and sometimes that could clean up but sometimes not so um, again I think that sort of goes back to that idea of like test stuff and, and see what works um, right. <clears throat> so let's revisit the um, Let's revisit this here. Did you it around the, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's still it's still a little brittle on those edges. Yeah. So, um, and like I said, there's still some work that needs to be done to that yeah. realistically, but it's pretty fun. Yeah. I'm just cleaning this tool up here. So the next the next step. On this is to pull this out. It's been cooking for an hour and a half or so now. The next step here is going to be um, to start both flattening it and removing some of the moisture. And that I generally do with um, just layers of paper. And, and as we were sort of talking about, you've got to put this mesh screen in between those layers so they don't stick to one another. Nylon or metal? What's up? Nylon or metal? Uh, nylon. The metal, I think, would react to the moisture and okay. probably it's end up with some, all kinds of weird stuff going on. So yeah, it's just nylon screen. I just buy it in rolls and, yeah. you know, I tend, tend, often I'm working with stuff that's relatively the same size, so this, like, that's a pretty good size for me. Um, I'm going to go grab a piece of card. So open this guy up. And I'm going to get some gloves on because this is pretty nasty. Of course, this is the problem with reusing gloves. Is <laughs> trying to find the fingers again. But, you know, when I'm doing this a lot, I tend to go through a lot of gloves. So. And Actually, last time I tried to buy gloves, I couldn't even find any. Paper towels here. Just pop this guy open. And you'll find the... Uh, you know what? I didn't get perfect coverage on that piece. Um, the slurry has kind of pulled some of the tannins out of the wood and it's, it gets a little dark. And, um, but the, and the whole thing is just kind of wrinkly, but it's pretty flexible, you know, I mean, that stuff is, it's soaked right in there, and I can, like, do stuff with that. There's no way I would have been able to do with a regular piece of veneer. Um, so I want to start getting some of this material off here now. Um, so what I usually do is just start kind of sponging this off a little bit. And the more you can pull off with the paper towels, the better. Uh, if I'm using, like, big sheets, I've done it with like literally a squeegee and you just kind of squeegee everything into a tray or something for small stuff like this. A little bit of um, paper towel works pretty well, but I want to try to get some amount of that off there. It just speeds everything else up. Oh, and do you always soften with this mixture or only when you're using for curved surface. Oh, really only for for curved stuff. I mean, honestly, if all I'm doing is, you know, a flat radial match or something, um, I will soften, but I probably won't bother with the PVA glue. I mean, because for if all I'm doing is putting a flat piece of veneer with maybe one or two seams in it, like I might not even flatten at all, frankly. I mean, a lot of the times you just straight up don't need to. Um, the more you have to actually seam things together, the more critical it is that that be like dead flat. Like if you're doing a you know 16 piece Sorry. radial match or something, right. and there's a little bit of wave to each piece, that just makes it increasingly more difficult to get those seams to come together. 
Um, so I tend to uh, flatten at that point, but I, I'm less worried about the flexibility then. I'm more worried about um, just sort of general flatness. So it is significantly easier to do this without the PVA. It's less of a process. I still would do it, I still would approach it in roughly the same way in the sense that I would, I still think you want full saturation on that, so I would still, you know, okay. soak it, wrap it in plastic and let it cook for an hour and then go through the same processes. It's just a little bit easier without the glue because you don't have to worry about it sticking to things. So you can get direct contact with the paper, um, which makes the whole thing a little bit faster. So you can follow the same recipe without the glue? You can follow the same recipe without the glue. You can honestly just use glycerin and water, works fine, maybe a little bit of alcohol. Um, you can also buy a couple of different commercial ones. They sell one at Woodcraft, um, they sell one through Joe Woodworker, they sell one through vacuum pressing systems. I mean, there's something to be said honestly for just buying it pre mixed. I mean, it works just as well. Um, so I usually just throw that away at this point. It's not really worth trying to reuse it. Um, and so I got these in between a couple pieces of screen and then what I do is I just, and I reuse this paper, you can reuse it several times at a certain point where there's so much glue in it that it doesn't absorb water anymore, but I will reuse it three or four times frankly, um, just so I'm not constantly throwing away paper. Um, and I just, I just want to make sure I've got a good amount you can use those crap paper bags too. Yeah, I definitely use paper bags. Um, this is, um, a lot of this is stuff that, like, some, depending on where you're getting things, sometimes you get things rolled in paper, and I just kind of sit, cut it up and save it. I've got a whole stack of it right there. Um, I just want to make sure I've got paper coverage on everything. And then this. You get it home. Oh. folks use. Yeah, that's a good idea. That stuff's really thick. Yeah, I can see that working, yeah. Um, I actually quite like that idea. I might, I might try that. Mm. Um, so that just goes in there, you don't know. All I'm really doing is just flattening at this point. There's no um, flattening and I'm, I'm starting to pull moisture out of, of, the, um, of the veneers. So there's not, not a lot that I'm really concerned about in terms of how I bag this. paper out, put it back in for another 30 minutes. I usually do that three times at 30 minute intervals. Sometimes on the when I get to the like third one, I maybe will go an hour or so at that point, depending on what I got going on in the shop. Um, but the idea is, is you just want to keep swapping the paper out. I usually try to do about four paper swaps in the bag if I've got time. And then I just pull the whole thing out and I, I just stack some weight on it and then let it sit. I mean, we got it all to work with just overnight, so, um, uh, you know, ideally if I can get right into that sort of like 24 to 48 hour window where I'm um, able to use it. So you ever stab it like with a moisture meter to see what the... Uh... I never have, but I suppose you could. Um, yeah, I, I'm, now that you mention it, I'd be kind of curious. Maybe I should do that sometime. Because yeah, you know what it feels like, you know. All right, so we got we did pretty well on that actually. So it's it's down, um, and it's almost exactly where I wanted it. I'm a little over the line here, but I can also see that what happened is it, it kind of did one of these a little bit. So I might not trim this all the way back to that line for this particular molding. What I might instead do is trim it to whatever that point is there, and if that's ahead of the line, I want to try to minimize 
what I'm cutting off here, um, if that makes sense. So, um, let's see, what do I want to do here? Um, uh, I mean, some of the things that we just talked about in terms of, okay, well, I'm across the grain. Um, so, you know, I might tape that. I don't, right now, I don't have anything underneath here, so I don't really care what's happening underneath. Um, uh, but I would, I would trim that back. I would, I would leave this. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to go. You don't have to follow me, but why don't I just trim it back so we've got a straight edge, and then we'll, we'll look at the... shooting for um, but I'm perfectly happy with that frankly like I said what's more important to me is that I'm removing the least amount of material from that so I get the least amount of grain shift when I go to put on my my edge so this guy here and how much time do we have um, so the reason I'm not taking the tape off right now, just a kind of a general rule of veneering, is you really don't want to remove your seam tape until that water-based glue is completely dry, because otherwise what can happen now is there's still a ton of moisture in this, everything's a little bit swollen. If I take that tape off and then it dries, it could shrink at the seams, and those seams can open up a little bit. So in general, you know, I usually tell people wait 24 hours before taking tape off of seams. Um, uh, you know, and generally, like if it's a panel or something, I'll take it out of the bag and I'll, I'll put it up on some calls so that there's airflow around the whole thing. In this case, it doesn't matter. There's no veneer on the bottom. But um, so to glue this, I mean, there's a few different ways we could do it. We could do it with our iron technique, um, and that's actually a really nice way of doing it. Um, ah, this stuff is so brittle. But what I usually end up doing is cursing the thing falling apart on me. <laughs> and I mean, I'm somewhat tempted to just tape the entire surface of this, frankly, but I need to be able to see it. So, like, what I might honestly do if I had more time, if I were doing this for real, is I might put a piece of tape across the back, flip this over, take all the tape off the front, and retape it with packing tape, and then take the tape off the back, if that makes sense, so that I can see what I'm doing, but the whole surface is... Because I think this is going to keep breaking apart on me, what frankly. What about uh, just scotch tape? Yeah, no, scotch like tape would work. Tape. I like packing tape, uh, partially because I always have it, and it's yeah. a little bit stronger than than. Um, and you know, for a lot of things, the width is pretty yeah. is pretty useful. Um, so I mean, the main. So what I usually end up doing is is gluing this and lining up my joint, and then just using a clamp, and then I will um, tape it in place. And I'll use um, a call and some clamps. Let's see what do I have we can use for a call. Let me go grab something real quick. Let me just do it really quick so you guys can see it. Sorry, I'm jumping around so much here. You think I'd be prepared? My motto is, as long as I'm prepared for the first 10 minutes, everything else usually just kind of falls into place. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, all right. So I'm just going to glue this surface. God knows what these are for, but they're here, so we use them. Could you iron that on? I could iron it on. Um, and it's, that might work very well. The problem I sometimes have with ironing things with taped seams is um, that process of like heating it and then letting, or, or rather putting a bunch of glue on it, letting that glue dry, then heating it, it can sometimes split those seams open. On something this size, it probably would work. Um, and that's not a bad way of doing it, frankly, because you have a ton of control. So if I could get that to work, um, that is probably how I would do it. But just to sort of see a different technique, not that this is really that interesting of a technique, I guess, but I think I would probably, I, I try to call stuff as much as possible when it's, um, uh, when it's got seams in it. I just, I just in general find that, it's interesting, I, this is something I've always had a problem with, is, um, seams opening up and uh, do you guys know um, Beth Ireland she's a turner yeah. um, I just had a conversation with her a couple weeks ago and I had just demoed this exact same thing at the CFC and she happened to be around she's teaching the turning intensive up there and um, I was complaining about that and she's like oh I do that all the time I've never had that problem I'm just like well, what am I doing wrong then so she only uses the gum tape so maybe it's it's possible the gum tape holds the seam a little bit better. So I need to experiment a little bit more um, because I'm clearly there is a way to do it, and I trust Beth because her she does amazing things. So um, so what I want to do is try to get this as close to this edge as possible and really pay attention, obviously, to my seams. And this is where you just kind of have to get zen. Just go to your special place. Um, focus on nothing else. So I'm just going to say that is good in that plane and get a piece of tape there. And the trick here is to kind of a combination of using tape and some time to get this to where it's not going to slide around on me too much because obviously once I put that call on there it's going to go all over the place so often what I will do with something like this is um, get it taped in place and then actually wait maybe four or five minutes let it tack up a little bit and then put the call on it. So you're trying to get that dead nuts to the point where you don't have to do any more trimming. No, 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 no. I'm 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 still overhanging it a, a little, little bit. bit. Okay. Yeah, but not much. I mean, the more I overhang it, the more grain shift there's going to be, and I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible. Um, so I, I I'm only overhanging it like a 32nd of an inch or so. Okay. But no, I don't want to, I'd rather, frankly, I'd rather have a little bit of grain um, shift than have that drop down. You know, I put the call on, it shifts slightly, and it drops below that surface, because then I'm, well, then I'm kind of buggered. You know, I mean, if you've got more of the same material, you could theoretically... Um, could you use... Uh Find salt or, or a little bit of sandpaper grip on the call. No, in in the glue joint to keep it. Oh, to stop from it from. I've never tried that. Is that a thing? Huh. Maybe. That's interesting. I mean, yeah, yeah I, don't I know. saw the technique you used on you know, something completely different. Yeah. Um, um, I. That's a really good question. I have no idea. That is not a question I've ever gotten or thought about. But yeah, I mean, sure. So I'm just gonna. Oh, ouch! Just putting some pressure on this. I'm just gonna spin this around. I'll do it so you guys can see it, but I don't think it's really helping. It's not doing me any favors. You know? 
you want where you need the other um, Alright, I, I just gotta get one on there, and once I get one on there, it should be good. There we go, we're good. Is that a straight flat edge, like a quarter inch flat? The call? The, uh, the piece you're veneering on, is it veneered on the, like, yeah, it's 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 about a no, it's it's flat. It's a quarter inch flat. I mean, you could you you could do a slightly radius edge, but then you really would need to hammer veneer it, or you'd have to have a very accurate call. You know. Um, could you um, vacuum that too, if you wanted to? I mean, in theory, it gets really difficult figuring out how to do little things like this in the vacuum bag. And honestly, if you can, if I can get a call on it, in some ways, it's You've got more pressure in the joint at that point. You just have to be able to... I mean, the problem with the vacuum bag is it becomes really difficult to predict exactly where the veneer is going to end up. There's some amount of it shifting around in there, and you sort of saw that on our, on our, um, you know, on the OG, where it's like it kind of did one of these a little bit. I mean, not to, to the point where it's problematic, but uh, it would be... It would also be hard to, like, get this to stand up straight. You, you'd probably have to, like, Grew it into something else through the back so that it didn't tip over when the bag. Stuck. So it probably wouldn't be worth it. Um, but that's good. I can kind of double check. I just want to make sure I'm up over the edge everywhere. It looks pretty good. And I've got like a nice even bead of squeeze out there. So we'll let that sit. And maybe right at the end we'll pop that off and we can. I'll see if I've made a fool of myself. Um, so that's that. Oh, and after that set, how do you, how would you clean up the one thirty second over here? Yeah. So uh, same way, really. Um, well, it, it probably will be dry enough before we, we wrap up, so I can kind of go through it. But what do I do with my little mat? There it is. Um, same idea. I would, you know, I get that down. You know, get that with the edge down. And I do one of these, you know, and get most of it off that way. And then where I can't do all of that, so like something like this, I, come, I would come along sort of on the flat. And I'm just cheating it up a little bit, so I'm not going quite flat to the surface. But you can get a lot of that waste material off there. And then... What is that knife called? This is an Alpha. Um, yeah, they're brilliant. So you, you get the body and then they're replaceable, replaceable blades. Um, I get them in two angle configurations. I like a 60 degree is like a really nice sort of general purpose. Um, a uh, cutting tool and then for like I use it as a marking knife and for marking I use a 30 degree because you can get into like tighter spaces so I use it to mark out dovetails and mortises for hinges and that kind of stuff and sometimes the that 30 or that 30 degree is really nice for getting into tight spaces to trim veneer back and whatnot so, um, so I usually have two I've got one loaded with a 60 and one loaded with a 30 um, but the 60 is the one I use most of the time because it just it holds the 30 um, the tips break off so quickly You know, it's like a paring chisel um, So once I've got most of that material off I go to um, a file of some kind um, Ideally I clamp this down somehow so that it's not moving around And then what you want to do is go, when you're filing, you want to go into the, the edge. You know, you don't want to go out. If I were to come out, I'd just start breaking that out. Um, and if you're working into a surface like this, you can put a little bit of tape on the end of your file so that you're not, um, you're not marring the surface of the veneer. That will usually clean up pretty nice. The um, and once I get that back 
like most of the way, then I will switch to a sanding block, which I just feel like I had. Um, this one's a little big. I usually have a smaller one of these kicking around. Um, and then same thing, I'm just going to sand into the, into the joint. Well, this is pretty aggressive. This is like 100. I, I, I realistically, I wouldn't use that. I'd probably use a 150. Um, generally, I, I tend not to touch the veneers with anything lower than a 150 because you have such a limited ability to sand this stuff that I kind of want to, I tend to start at 150. But I mean, prior to any like major surface sanding, I'm going to, I usually do a lot of um, scraping to get like glue off and and you'll find like with this stuff that's sized with the with the PVA glue, you, you're kind of evening out that surface and taking off any marks from the mash and, and whatnot. But, so it's a combination of knife to get the bulk of the material off, then then I file that edge and um, this is actually a tiny little um, rasp, but a file works fine too. Um, these are those Aurora, 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 Aurora. Those um, French, they're like hand stitched wraps. They sell them at Lee Nielsen. They're stupid expensive, but they're also awesome. So as soon as you use one, you're like, oh, I must have. I like, must have these. <laughs> um, but they're beautiful. Um, but you could just literally use like a second cut file, like a second cut bastard file, um, just of Nicholson, you get it at the hardware store. I wouldn't use like a first cut because they're a little aggressive, but the second cut works really well. So, um, so I'll pass it on, you can kind of see how the edge cleans up. Um, so I do the same thing on this, it's a little more tedious in here because of that OG, you can't get straight across that edge. So what I would tend to do is kind of, you know, treat it like this, where I'm most of my stroke is going into that edge, but I'm also moving forward in a linear sort of manner, if that makes sense. Um, all right, so I think we have enough time here to get this in the vacuum bag. If you guys want to see that, um, so. I will talk here for a minute and then we'll hop over there and, and just put it in the bag. Um, so, like I said, uh, curved stuff, covered in filth, um, curved stuff, it's pretty easy to, like I presume, this is a bent lamination, I made it on a, a mold um, and it would be pretty easy now to put that back on the mold that I used to make the lamination and then I pop that whole thing in the vacuum bag and you get a decent amount of adhesion on that surface there because the bag is just conforming to that curve. What I have found, and it is generally true, that once I take this off of the mold, there are slight inconsistencies between this curve and the curve on the surface of the mold. So if I were to just put a veneer here and put that back on the mold, it might work but it also might not. What you might end up with is like a little point where you didn't quite have adhesion on the, um, uh, on the whole surface. Something I have done that does actually work, um, and it's, in some ways it's easier than what I'm about to show you, but it's, it's not foolproof, is I could, I could put something pliable in between these two surfaces, um, that yoga mat, for example, if I were to put that and then put that on top of the mold, that kind of evens things out and just kind of evens out the pressure. Um, and in some ways that might be easier. The, let's actually jump over there and we'll talk about the... We're going to use a bag without the platen. And use a breather mesh to um, move the air across the piece. Let me swap this guy. So that, so basically I just I switched one valve off, switched the other one on, and turned that up. So this will hold a vacuum for some amount of time. Um, typically in, in my uh, process here, I would probably veneer the outside first on the mold, take it off, and then we'll veneer this side. And I'm going to do a few things here. 
Um, I'm still going to use a call, um, partially again to just sort of distribute things, the pressure a little bit, and just sort of even stuff out. I find that this, um, it's just Formica, you can buy it at Home Depot, it's pretty cheap. Um, it works real nice because it's got a surface that the glue's not going to stick to, and that'll conform to a lot of curves, really. I mean, pretty much anything a veneer will conform to, at least in one plane, um, that'll conform to. So I'm going to put that, so it's going to go veneer, formica. I'm going to wrap the whole thing in plastic, and then the last thing I'm going to do is wrap some of this breather mesh. And the way this works, it's got a, um, it's got a cross grain to it, uh, and the the pieces on the underside and the piece on the top create a channel through which the air can then, then move. This has to be, you know, this has to be underneath the outlet for, for the vacuum hose. So in this case, this small bag, I just have that in the center. So as long as I'm under the panels underneath that, it, it'll work. You know, and if I, I could take all of this platinum and everything out of this bag, and do it here. In this case, it would be harder to get the valve directly under the workpiece. So then you just have to have a long, a long enough piece of breather mesh that you can wrap it around the piece and then run it out to that outlet, if that makes sense. So, um, but it, it's kind of nice if you're doing this to have a bag that's set up more this way, if you can. Like I said, you can do it in this. It's just a bit more pain. Um, but we're going to try to do this real quick. If the substrate were flat, would you be able to veneer just one side at a time and not have it warm? Um, yeah, I try to do it relatively. If I am doing that, I try to do it relatively quickly. Um, like I'll do the one surface, let it cook for 30 minutes or so, pop it out, do the second surface, put it back in again, and then take it out and put it up on calls and let it dry. I try not to let there be too much time in between. Right. But if I can on a flat panel, I usually try to do both surfaces at yeah. once, unless it's so big that that becomes impractical. Right, no, that's a time run. Yeah, exactly. Um, because it is something that I get concerned about. I mean, particularly with these PVA glues, you're just putting so much um, liquid and so much water into yeah. the piece that. that war war yeah, oh, it'll happen. Yeah. I mean, I usually, you know, if I'm teaching veneering, I will, I will often do one without, um, sorry, it's okay. terrible at remembering where the line of sight is for the camera. Um, they've installed, since COVID, they've installed all these video cameras in the classrooms at the CFC, and um, I'm really awful at remembering where they are, so like, I'd say at least 50% of the time, all the students are seeing is the top of my head. Which, which is, honestly, it's been like an immersion therapy for like being okay with being bald because I just see the top of my head so much that I'm like, all right, I guess I just gotta live with this now. Uh, so I'm gonna pop this on here. And we're just gonna get a few pieces of tape just to kind of, again, Try to minimize, I mean, depending on what I'm doing here, I hopefully have been able to oversize this slightly. Um, you know, in an actual application, chances are I would have, I would have edged this with a piece of solid wood or something so that you're not seeing plywood edges, in which case I would typically make that slightly oversized so I have some ability to sort of trim everything after the fact. I'm going to put this down, make sure we remember to put it the right side down. I'm actually going to take this in place as well. I just learned the hard way to make sure there's enough glue on the edge. Yeah, so you want some squeeze up. Right. Although, like I said, once you um, once you got yourself an iron in the shop, <laughs> you, you have some ability to... Like, edges is, is in some ways significantly less problematic than having, like, say, too much glue in the middle, which is a real nightmare. Yeah. Too little in the middle. Wrap this up here, and then I'm going to put this whole thing in here. Why are you rubbing it in plastic? Um, honestly, just to kind of keep glue out of the oh, out of the bag, and it just kind of keeps everything a little bit cleaner. Is that consistent still that small bag? Um, no, this one um, is from QualityVac.com. Um, they they sell bags of all kinds of different sizes and they sell like clearance bags like every couple of months they'll put up a list of clearance bags 
And some of them are like stupid cheap, so I usually, if the sizes, I'm like, oh, that looks like it'll be useful. I will usually will just buy them just to have. That was called Quality Bag. QualityVac.com, I think. Back, B-A-K, I think. And that'll cycle for a bit. Those are the guys down in Massachusetts. Yeah, they are. They're in Mass. Um, so it's it's kind of that simple. That's that's basically it. I lost my mesh there. Um, but the, the, the important surface is this one because that's the one that I'm actually vacuuming. Oh, and that's uh, that's the key to change that out. But you guys don't really. Need it. So let me just turn that off and. Um, <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of minutes if you guys have questions about any of that stuff. Um, the process, so that was the timer, that was my first 30 minutes on this. Um, sort of no massive mystery to to what I do there, turn that back on. Um, actually, no. um, uh, I just pop that out. I just swap it out with fresh paper. I still want to keep it in the mesh. I'm going to keep it in the mesh through the first several changes. In fact, in general, I just sort of keep it in the mesh rather than risk it. I have a couple times I have too quickly taken it out of the mesh and just put it directly in the paper, and then it's a real mess. So. Um, <laughs> But again, if you're not using the PVA glue in your in your mix, um, you don't need the, the mesh at all. You just put it directly on the paper. So, any other questions on any of that stuff? No doubt, I've done such a good job that you guys can go and do all of this now without me. Um, you're doing a great job in time. Where your phone? I got it. So we got, we still got a couple minutes. We could pop the call off of that. Edge piece and see how we did. I'm like first in line when they drop the new cheap bags because I was, you know now you guys know where to get the cheap bags. You're gonna buy them all before I get there. Enough. <laughs> Can't ever have enough vacuum bags. Or clamps. Or clamps. Um, so that's pretty good. I mean, I'm 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 happy with that. It got dangerously close to the edge there. But um, I mean, this is still honestly, it's a bit. I, I wouldn't. I would. I probably wouldn't have even taken it out of the calls yet. I certainly wouldn't start doing this. But just so you guys kind of see it. I mean, at this point, I just get in there and just start removing some of this. Get that out of there. Do you ever use any of the circular opal dies? I, you know what, I haven't, and it has occurred to me that those probably work pretty well. Have you, Richard? I, I use all the time for cross grain. And is it all? Do they yeah, work? It's, it, the it's the rotary cutters. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, my my wife sews, and she has them for yeah. for cutting fabric, and it has certainly occurred to me that it probably works. I just have never. Um, Don't use hers. Yeah. Well, no kidding, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely have to go get my own, but uh, that's actually good. That's a cool recommendation. Yeah. I will try that. Um, always looking for easier ways to cut veneer for sure. Yeah. Where did you get the cutting mat, the green mat? Um, honestly, I think this one I got from Joanne Fabric and that big one I got from Amazon. Oh, from Joanne Fabric? Yeah. Oh. yeah. It's a fabric, it's a self-healing yeah, like fabric cutting mat. Yeah. Um, I mean, this one's I've kind of cannibalized and cut into pieces for various things. And that one, I, I don't know what happened. I, this is actually not even that old of a map, but it's already split it. Um, and it's, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing I cut too deeply, maybe, and it just and it split on it. Um, but, you know, this isn't that old. It's only a couple years old. Usually I can get them the last little bit on them. But they're great. I love those things. Um, so that's... Um, that's that. I mean, like I said, it's a little early, but um, you know, the next step would be, you know, get in here and just start working that edge back, you know, and, and take that down. 
And, and then the last thing I'd probably do is just take some 150 and start sanding that edge. And I might, you know, this is where it gets kind of like really problematic with this stuff. It's like, all right, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to, I got to sand this surface. I try to scrape as much as possible. Um, but, you know, I think you guys can see, like, once that starts cleaning up, like, that's a pretty decent match there. Um, let's uh, muscle a little bit on that. Any other questions? Anything else? I'm available for other questions. Meaning of life. I think I've got that figured out. <laughs> what, are, what is the big cylinder over here? That's going to be a base for a dining table. I'm doing a six-foot radial match with a big roll edge. Oh my goodness. And that's the base. So this is the oh. sample for the... Wow. We actually, we're, it's different. I ended up being different. This was a nightmare job. Working for designers was a pain in the ass, you know. <laughs> um, this has been like this incredible process of like... I, I literally at one point ran out of veneers to suggest, you know, and I had to go and talk to the people at Certainly Wood and they suggested some things I'd never even heard of. Um, but it's going to be a big six foot radial match with this so you did that edge the same way you just did this, right? Uh, this I did in the vacuum bag, actually. Yeah, okay. um, because I'm, I'm not trying to go all the way around. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seam it in the center and, mm -hmm. and put a piece of string and, in And then the bag, you didn't get the pleats? Um, no, because, I'm, well, first of all, it's a six-foot radius, or it's three-foot radius, so it's, it's a much gentler curve than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not trying to get all the way around a bullnose. I'm only going halfway around. And you can you can pretty in the vacuum bag you can pretty much pull it down to that center point. Um, after you hit the center point, it won't go past that. Yep. So my my goal, and this is all looks great on paper, but when I've actually got a six foot thing in the vacuum bag, we'll see. Um, is just to pull it down as far as I can, and then seam the center of it, and then put another piece. And I'm going to seam. I think. Um, so this, the way I did this sample, and I'm probably going to have to refine this a little bit, but um, it basically, where is it? I made a custom bearing for a wing cutter and then came in and cut it with a wing cutter at that point where I, I couldn't pull the veneer down anymore. And then I'm going to inlay a, a piece of um, stringing into that. As like a That's detail, cool. basically. Oh, what, I don't, kind of, what is that? Well, this is Macassar Ebony, but we're actually not using that. This this was a early sample in the process. Is the other piece veneer, or is that solid wood? Um, this is it's all veneer. Oh, yeah. the, the nosing is solid wood. So it's, I'm going to make it out of like a honey piece of honeycomb cardboard with um, plywood over it. So it's going to be two inches thick, and it's going to be heavy if I try to do it. So, so I'm going to use that honeycomb cardboard. Um, Torsion box structure in the center, oh. um, and then solid wood edge, and then veneer over that. Oh. So, so um, what what veneer did you wind up going with? You don't remember the name. You know what? I knew you were going to ask that, and I'm <laughs> racking my brains trying to remember what the hell it's called. But well, I have can, it over here, and I just it. show you. It's something I've literally never heard of <laughs> until the sales guy. First on, it's called Paldeo. Oh yeah. And it's not going to have a field and an edge. It's just going to be the one thing, and, and that's going to roll into the into the bullnose. So, which is in some ways is easier. And what is that? It's called Paldeo. Paldeo. Yeah. Wow. So a little table with this. Yeah. And the base. No, base is going to be a, a <coughs> ebonized maple. Uh, it's just it's dark. Black. Yeah. Dark. They, they dye it that way though? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be the veneer that's already on that column and then um and then uh it, it's actually it probably won't be truly ebonized in the sense that it's not gonna be black, it's gonna be something more like a brownie kind of black like that. So you will paint it. You, it won't be paint, it'll be a dye so yeah. that you can Going still see the grain. Make it with vinegar and uh, steel wool. Well, you, that was one way of doing it. I, honestly, I don't really do that. I just, I, there's a Finnish guy down the hall and he does a lot of color stuff and whenever there's color involved, I just have him do it because I, it's not really my forte and I don't enjoy it. Well, so. I did some uh, turned uh, legs for a William & Mary chest and uh, ebonized them. Uh, use it with walnut with the... Uh, yeah. The, out really nice. Yeah, no, that's gorgeous wow. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. 
I've been doing a lot of ebonized ash stuff recently. Like all, a lot of designers right now really want like the ebonized ash. That's, yeah. Really which I, ash, I mean, yeah. it's fun. It's cool, but but um, but I like again. I you know at this point I'm like well I, I already am feeling like I'm, there's no way I'm going to be good at everything. So I might as well be good at the things I enjoy and let somebody else be good at the things I don't. <laughs> and, I, and I don't like finish so. And oh, I just feel there's enough of the grain will remain with the dark stain like that. Well, this is not going to, this will be natural. So it'll just be the base, the maple base. Will be, yeah, because this. Um, and it will be pie shaped. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's going to be, technically, it's not a radial match. It'll be a what's called a pie match. Like a radial match technically would be. Um, like the wedges would be like this, so they book match. Oh, yeah, yeah. But this is actually going to be a pie match, which is like right down the barrel of the grain, essentially, which is way easier. So I'm so glad that they chose that. <laughs> huh. um, Where did you get the veneer? Um, a supplier in um, New York called Certainly Wood. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. Oh, they're great. I love those guys. I, yeah. I, it's always the first place I call for veneers. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and unless they don't have something I'm looking for, I will get. Yeah, they're really you. helpful. Why did, oh, they yeah. choose, why did they choose the pie match as opposed to the three? Um, because they wanted. I mean, we looked so. You know, I did the mirror thing. Um, I mean, this this was such a nightmare. I actually went, ended up buying three foot mirrors that were eighteen inches high, oh, so that so I could nice. actually show them the whole thing because they weren't quite getting. Like I had a set of mirrors that were, you know, this size. <laughs> And they weren't quite getting the yeah. the full understanding of it, so I ended up getting a oh, full wow. three foot mirror that was tall enough, that, and then I hung lights off the side of the mirror. Oh, okay. I mean, this was like it was <laughs> pulling was teeth to get that's decisions really cool. to be made. On this. <laughs> See, <laughs> but, yeah, that's what the table look like. Yeah, exactly. That. Yep. That's so cool. Yeah. Less pieces, though, right? Or is that how many? Um. Well, it, I mean, the pieces are basically determined by my width. So I've got, you know, I've got to make it all the way around a six foot radius, and my pieces are probably going to finish out at seven inches. So whatever the radius of, or not radius, the circumference of a six foot table is divided by seven. I think I'm somewhere around forty somewhat pieces, probably. How big table? Six feet. Circle. Yeah, six feet round. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, they decided they liked the look of the grain disappearing into the point rather than like a true radial match, which would be more like this. So you've got, you know, a straight and an angle and you know, straight angle. Are you gonna, are you gonna hide the center with yeah, the, the little round piece? I'm gonna nail it, Elliot. I'm gonna have perfect <laughs> points. That are I you wanna, kidding me? <laughs> I'm gonna do that. I wanna, I wanna be here to watch you. Or, okay. <laughs> I can't believe you'd even question that. Can share? And then, and then if it uh, if it doesn't work, I'll just put an eagle in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm I'm hoping to nail it, and if I don't, we'll cross that bridge when when I get to it. But. Are you doing the chairs for it? Uh, no, they actually have a, a ch the chairs they already have. They're a set of antique chairs that they had refinished that have been in the family for a while. So um, mm -hmm. I don't generally make chairs, frankly. Not because I don't enjoy it, but because the economics of it. Are, I find it very difficult to sell a chair job that I can make money on. And it, maybe it's just that I'm not fast enough at making chairs, but I can make really good money on a dining table. I find it very difficult to make money on, on chairs. So. so it's not something I've really focused on, frankly. Will you fill that, the veneer, or fill it? Say that again? Will you pour fill that veneer? Um. I don't know. This doesn't. I, I don't think so because it doesn't seem like a very. I mean, it, it's a little fuzzy. I'll be interested to see what this. I haven't. Like, I literally haven't even glued up a sample of this yet to start playing with it. Pore fill me. Um. So, like on open grain woods, you can you can fill the pores with a filler, basically that flattens the whole thing. So when you put the finish over it, it doesn't you know pool into those open pores. Honestly, that's a discussion I'd probably have with my finisher, and if that's what he wants, then. Well, and it will depend. Well, is pretty, you know, fairly porous. Yeah, I'm not really, like I said, I haven't even, so that will be a conversation between myself, the designer, and the, uh, you know, I don't know if she wants, like, a completely grain-filled, it's not a mirror finish, it's, it's not, like, a high-gloss finish, mm -hmm. it's actually, like, more of a matte finish, so we may be able to get away with not doing that, but. Now, I, when you're 
uh, applying veneer to a substrate, I mean, is that something that you think about? That you, you know, whether or not you want any any glue seeping oh, through? Oh, seeping through? Um, well, again, I, I haven't even glued up a sample, so I don't know how it's going to behave. I mean, this is a big enough glue up. I'm going to have to do it with Unibot 800. There's no way mm -hmm. I could do it with a PVA glue. So. You, know, you can adjust the color. Exactly. I can, adjust, I can tint it, and I, you can also use a filler that to some extent prevents it from... So I, I bought almost twice as much of this as I need. In fact, I may have, I, what I bought is I bought everything they had from this log because <laughs> it ended up being cheaper and I figured that way I, I could both play around with it and I could make some mistakes. Exactly. So, um, so I've got plenty, so at some point in the next few weeks I'm going to start cutting it up and laying it up and I've got to do some finished samples. And I, it's, it's, it's not the next project in the queue. I've got a couple of things I've got to finish up before I can really focus on this, but it's something I'm going to try to get done this spring. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, Owen. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah.